We're not in probably the worst economic outlook that maybe we feared a few months ago, but things aren't good. Just about everything is worse within the leading indicators, and it continues to suggest that, yes, we are going to have some kind of a recession. The market has been buying into this far better than expected story for Europe. We have basically a call for a recession in the U.S. starting in Q3. Everyone is saying, look, earnings expectations are still too high. I don't disagree with that, but I disagree with the sequencing. I disagree with the timing. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow in London, Lisa Abramowitz and Tom Keen in New York. It is a time of new accommodation. Lisa, it's real simple. The Bloomberg Financial Christ, uh, the Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index screams Jay Powell do something. Well, it screams no. that we're going to get perhaps uh, less rate hikes, fewer rate hikes, and perhaps the Fed being a little bit more accommodative sooner. And I do think yesterday's Bank of Canada decision really informed I that. agree. It was, it was secondary, but important. It was yes. important because, yes, they did come out with the ex expected step down, but then they suggested they might pause. They might not raise rates again. And that's the reason why you're seeing even greater accommodation, at least, in the rate space. Reset Thursday here with a lot of economics coming up. Michael McKee with that GDP report at the 830 uh, mark. And across that is a data that's, you know, some Nolan, I think, is the fancy word. John, you know, John's, you know, Victorian history or whatever he's taking. It's a, it's a course he's taking. Is that what he's doing He's right testing now? at University he's, of London. He's doing Victorian history. Futures up eight after, did, did you, could you explain the stock market yesterday? I took the surveillance nap and woke up to up. You know, this to me was actually fascinating because the market wants to go up. We saw it down yes. more than a percent, more than 2% at one point on the NASDAQ, clawing all of it back almost, ending almost flat after a lot of people really having some negative things to say about the prospective uh, outlook ahead. Honestly, this morning, we see IBM shares lower after they reported better than expected earnings <clears throat> well. because what do they do in a slowing environment? By the end of the day, are they going to be up three? I don't know what it's going to be, and I haven't read Julian Emanuel's morning earnings update note, and I'll get to that, and we'll report that to you. But Microsoft is almost a proxy for the bizarreness of where we are now, up big on the headlines, then down doom and gloom 24 hours ago when we were sitting here, and they crawled their way back yesterday to barely green. I mean, I, I think the ambivalence that I'm seeing out there on a Thursday is extraordinary. If we get a soft landing, does that mean that any downturn in growth prospects are short-lived? I, I, we look at the data here, and I'm going to call it today, Thursday, it's the new accommodation is what we've got here. And you see it in that summation of the Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index to review a huge negative numbers restrictive, Europe more restrictive uh, right now. Not only do we grind positive, but at a positive 0.28 standard deviations, that's the statistic on the Bloomberg screen. Which is fascinating because the economic data has been coming in disappointing more often than not in the United yeah, States. I, I, it's a different story, yeah. as John was pointing out yesterday over in Europe. But in the <clears throat> U.S., you have seen this grind to a lower level. So at what point, you know, again, does that inform some sort of negativity? Or do people say it's priced in because of the sell-off we got last year? A raft, as they say, of economic data. The Chicago Fed National Activity Index is Lisa's favorite. We get to the GDP. And <laughs> Lisa's going to cover that in the brief. I don't want to steal the thunder oh, of thanks. durable goods. I appreciate that. Durable goods in the brief. Now, there's a lot of <laughs> excitement. Futures up eight. Dow futures up three. The VIX nicely under 20 after that uh, good news back half of uh, yesterday that we saw in the yield space. Not much to talk about. Uh, all in all, two ten spread, negative 67 basis points, a lesser inversion over the span of the number of days. I'm running out of steam here, Lisa. There's just, I got Euro 109. I guess that's an important point. We really print a strong year 109 who said yesterday 115 is feasible yeah well we were hearing that just a couple days ago from mark mccormick and from yeah. many others because they're taking a look at the optimism that you're seeing there you didn't want to steal my thunder but you know we are talking all about uh, fourth quarter gdp and that's not thunder <clears throat> that's actually really important to dig into and it's not just the absolute number which is expected to slow down to 2.6 percent from north of three percent uh, in the prior quarter still positive though but we're also getting core pce durable goods orders as you mentioned uh, for december and initial jobless claims. We're also getting the core PCE for the fourth quarter, and this goes ahead of what we get tomorrow <clears throat> with a similar kind of read in a more real time. How much do we get that deceleration? And if we don't, does that actually matter in terms of informing this lesser restriction that perhaps uh, we'll have to then reverse? At 1 p.m., auctions. I'm going to keep going with this, Tom. 
I Keep actually going. think important. Day after day. <laughs> day after day. Uh, alone on the Hill. U.S. is selling $35 billion of seven-year notes. No, it's been two uh, straight days of very successful auctions. This is telling, because last year, well, they were not successful. People we'll weren't to, coming in. We'll have to see what it does there in the Arvo. We'll have to see how, how the auction uh, plays out here at 1 p.m. Can I just uh, give you some today. warnings? Please. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. So or, Intel or uh, is after today. the market, and, and all before market, we get a bunch of airlines, American Air, Southwest, and JetBlue. I am curious about Intel, because we've seen well, such yeah. complete, uh, you know, absolute carnage in the chip yeah. space. What do we get today? How much has been priced in, considering Intel's down 43% in the past 12 months? Helene Becker will be with us on the Airlines Alaska Air reporting right now. Just a single headline, capacity up 11 to 14%. That'll be an important idea. What do the airlines do to bring more on here so Pharaoh can get home from London? He is in London. That is a good and beautiful thing. Testing restaurants from here to Shining uh, Sea, and he talks foreign exchange in the morning. John, how is London? Tom, you know, reflecting on 1901, it was a difficult year for us all. <laughs> our great empire. This is very Victorian okay. history. What are you about this morning? The city of Shinakis, <laughs> head of European FX strategy at City, with us in London. I'm going to have Brecky while you talk. You do that. For Cilios, let's talk about FX. And let's talk about the difference right now between people constructive on the US economy and people who are less so. The people who are less so are clinging to sub-50 PMIs. The people who are constructive are looking at jobless claims data, which comes out in about 2 hours 30 minutes, which is in and around 200,000. Which one is it? Well, I think as it frequently is the situation, we're somewhere in between. There is a slowing in the US economy, and, and that's, defi that's definitely visible in the manufacturing sector, especially as you mentioned in the soft survey data. But then again, you, one has to contrast this with an extremely tight and a historically tight labor market. So therefore, uh, this is not going to be an easy one uh, for the Fed. I mean, currently the market is pricing 4.9%, let's call it 5% terminal rate. I think we could reprice a bit higher, um, but to the extent that we only reprice modestly higher, I don't think that, say, 25 basis points of repricing higher is going to be neither here nor there for the dollar. Because I think we've switched regime. The, the, the Fed has become a far maturing theme. We're getting close to the peak. And now the driving seat is global growth expectations. And this has been, you know, reignited by the Chinese reopening. And this is what is driving the markets. If you, if you approach this statistically, you can actually say that during the first, quarter, the first three quarters of 2022, U.S. yields explained around 90% of the dollar variation. Right now, they explain about 15%. Whereas if you go back and you look at underlying fundamentals surveys, they are now in the lead. And that's because expectations are being rated higher. So I'm not trading rights anymore. I'm trading copper. Is that a fair way of putting it? I think, uh, well, to a certain extent, yes. I think uh, there's definitely going to be some increased demand for uh, commodities. I mean, it will vary from um, uh, one commodity to another. But, but the bottom line is that uh, we are talking about a country who has been shut from the rest of the world for, about, for more than 1,000 days. Uh, of course, there was uh, trade going on. But right now, I think there is going to be some significant aspects of pent-up demand that are going to start showing, and therefore Chinese imports and therefore upside pressure on commodities is going to manifest. This is the third year of pandemic economics. That's what Tom, right. Lisa and I have been talking yeah. about now for the last couple of weeks. Every single year of those three years, particularly the last two, we've got wrong. The consensus view has been terribly off course. Can you tell me what you think we're underpricing right now with regards to China reopening? Well, I, I, could, I could see it both ways. I don't think right now, if you look in the currency market, uh, that we have reached levels uh, that price in fully a relatively smooth uh, Chinese reopening. For example, if I look at the euro dollar market, uh, our estimates of fair value are between 115 to 117, where 109, very important level, I suspect uh, if, sorry, when more than if we break it, uh, we're going to see a, a lot of real money demand and demand from corporates as well. It's going to push it higher. And historically, what you tend to see is that when you are in periods of um, a significant undervaluation and then you start correct towards fair value, you don't just correct there and you sit there. You typically overshoot it. So um, uh, my point here is that I think we still have some way to, to go in order to reprice um, uh, the Chinese reopening.
How much of an inflationary impulse do we import from China into the United States? This is, uh, um, uh, in China, I, I think uh, China is going to be much more relevant for Europe uh, compared to, for example, the, the US. But I think this is uh, an element about the upside pressure on commodity prices and therefore inflation that has come up very frequently with clients. And my only observation to this is that uh, what is driving inflation is extremely important. Uh, so um, in 2021 and parts of 2022, it was supply side driven. So you had muted domestic activity and you had inflation squeezing an already damaged economy. But this time around, if inflation is being driven by the demand side of the economy, by Chinese imports, then it will still create challenges for uh, central banks. But it's not the same gameplay. It's a more traditional way of dealing with inflation. You have increased demand and therefore you have some upside pressures on, on prices. And that prompts central bank response, but not to the extent that it will squeeze uh, incomes as it did uh, during the course of 2020. Which should lead to a stronger currency in Europe. So euro dollar right now 109. Can you run me through some numbers, what you're thinking about over the next three, six months? Right. So I think 109 is, as I said before, is very important. I think potentially next week is going to be a catalyst for the euro to break convincingly uh, higher. Uh, and I say this because I expect the ECB to be hawkish. Uh, and I think the Fed will deliver 25 basis points, although there are some hawkish risks uh, into that uh, meeting as well. Um, and if we break that, it will become particularly painful for uh, real money accounts and corporates who have not participated um, in, in the big move to chase the currency higher. And I think uh, then, you know, we could converge to 115 and even potentially higher, absent, of course, black swans. I mean, there are a lot of risks into that scenario, That's right? Vasilios, this was great. Vasilios Janakis there. A 109, looking for a break of that potentially, Tom, going into the ECB next week. TK, I've got to say there's a feeling here on this side of the Atlantic that a lot of what we've seen over the last couple of weeks was short covering and the longs are right. only just getting going. Yeah, I really agree with that. The pivot point here is how do we shift folks from short covering on to a true long debate is a huge part of what we'll talk about this morning. Phil Camperell will help us with that with JP Morgan Asset Management. Again, futures lift, futures up 10. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Russia has launched a major barrage of missile attacks against Ukraine. Authorities there say the attacks were aimed at energy infrastructure and other civilian targets in Kyiv and other cities. The assault happened a day after the U.S. and Germany promised to supply Ukraine with tanks. That gives Ukrainian forces a significant upgrade. Meta Platforms is reinstating former President Trump's Facebook and Instagram accounts after a two-year suspension. His accounts will be subject to what the company calls guardrails, and there will be specific penalties for rule-breaking. The former president was reinstated in Twitter in November, but hasn't posted there yet. Business confidence in the UK has sunk to its lowest level since the global financial crisis. That's according to a survey from the Institute of Chartered Accountants, which cites inflation and weakening customer demand. Companies in the retail, property and manufacturing sectors were particularly downbeat. Morgan Stanley has fined some of its own bankers more than $1 million each for conducting business on WhatsApp and other mess messaging platforms. Bloomberg's learned the funds have either been clawed back from previous bonuses or will be docked from future pay. It's the latest fallout from an investigation that saw banks dish out hundreds of millions of dollars in fines. And Asia's richest person, Gota Modani, is fighting back. The business empire he controls is considering legal action against activist investor Hindenburg Research. The firm accused Adani's business of market manipulation and accounting fraud. The Adani empire lost $12 billion in market value on Wednesday. Global news, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. been saying this for a long time. The expectation on the part of Russia is we're going to break up. We're not going to stay united. But we are fully, thoroughly, totally united. 
President of the United States, going from tank to tank story tomorrow, that was a huge issue. We thank Amory Horton yesterday for tank wisdom here is, I believe, German-American United Kingdom tanks at some point uh, get to Ukraine. Is Well, it's interesting to see the Allied setup here, Lisa, uh, as we— is we try to get ourselves out of this winter. I'm told there wasn't war in winter. I guess Ukraine never got the memo about no war in winter. What I fact is there is. There also is this need to keep the NATO alliance firm and the need to agree on providing tanks and this sort of <clears throat> question of whether Biden really went into providing tanks in part to support Olaf Scholz in keeping that NATO alliance together. I mean, it's going to be interesting to see, to say, say the least. There's any number of ways to go this morning on Washington. And what I'm going to do is work off the great Lisa Lehrer's work in The New York Times. I can do that with Emory Horner, uh, uh, Bloomberg chief Washington correspondent. Emory, I think Lisa's article with Reed Epstein in The New York Times is just brilliant about we know the Democrats are a mess, but we never talk about the Republicans are a mess. And they speak to 180 so members that are going to be out in California anointing a new RNC leader. And there is from um, Mac Brown of Kentucky, the pregnant statement, this isn't 2016. Explain the relationship that you report between the former president and his RNC. Well, I think we do actually talk a lot about some of the dysfunction in the Republican Party, and I think it was on full display at the at the start of this year, the start of the 118th Congress. But when you're looking at the Republican Party going into 2024, which if they're saying this is in 2016, there is a lot of talk within this party that they want to move away from the Trump Error politics. They many do not see him as the leader to bring them forward in forward into 2024. That's also going to be on display not just in California, but also in Georgia. We're waiting for this indictment and potentially this can harm those individuals, either the former president or those individuals surrounding him. So I think that is a big conversation for Republicans for the next two years, obviously, as they look to see who is going to be leading their campaign into the presidential race, <clears throat> because we are seeing how divided they are at the moment. Moment right. when you look at what's going on in Congress. I think it's a mystery, and particularly to our international audience, and Kurt Wagner and Mark Niquette pick up on this today for Bloomberg, of how the RNC uses Facebook. To be honest, I'm unsure. how If, if Instagram and Facebook bring the president back, what does it actually do? I, I mean, he's not sitting there at Mar-a-Lago tweeting, is he, or, or Instagramming or Facebooking, is he? Well, he's certainly not tweeting because he's not still not on the Twitter platform, but he does frequently, I would say almost every day, post on Truth Social. So I think a question also remains that they wanted to make Truth Social a viable alternative to some of these social media platforms. What happens if the president of the United States then starts to ditch the former president start to ditch Truth Social and maybe start using Facebook and Instagram. I mean, he has millions of followers on these applications, but you know, it remains to be seen if he's going to embrace them as he did in the past. Let's tie these two ideas together, this question of how much unity there is plus social media. How much unity is there still in really ratcheting up the pressure on China with respect to TikTok on both sides of the aisle? So this was a, a proposal that from Congressman Hawley that wants to ban TikTok nationally. So we've seen Congress take steps to ban TikTok on government phones. We've also seen private institutions like colleges ban TikTok on individuals' phones, on college students' phones. From Republicans, what you're hearing is that they want to go forward and they want to get rid of TikTok. So far, Democrats are waiting really from their cue from the White House on how they want to handle this potential legislation. But as I've said many a times, you'd be hard pressed to find a congressman or woman or senator in Washington, D.C. that does not want to look like they are tough on China. And potentially TikTok is one of these avenues because many question how the how ByteDance and potentially the Chinese government is harvesting some American data and also what kind of analysis and analytics they are using to push certain stories. And many of young Americans are now turning to TikTok to get their news. There's one caveat I would say, Lisa, and this is something that the Trump administration ran into, and this has to do with some of these big mega funders in the business community, like Doug Leone of Sequoia Capital. 
if these individuals have investments in these kind of companies, are they going to start to call lawmakers and say, now you're pushing it too far? And, Ray, I'm glad you went there, because to me, that's the bigger story here, is that you have seen this bipartisan support for increasing the distance between the U.S. and China on a trade level. And yet, when you see businesses, they're absolutely doubling down on their presence in China. How much is that dissonance mm -hmm. coming to the fore with respect to donations and pressure from the business universe? Well, I don't think it's out in the forefront at the moment, and none of the none of this legislation has hit the floor for votes. But I do think this is a tension that we've seen in the past, especially when it comes to what the Trump administration wanted to do regarding TikTok, that this is something that could be lingering over politicians' heads. And I just think it remains to be seen whether or not there's going to be a massive pushback from these investors who are also lining the pockets of politicians, but also want to make sure their investments are growing and are mm. safe if they have them in China. Quickly, Emery, what's the president's day look like? What's he doing today? Today he's going to Virginia and he's going to be giving an economic speech. And I think the most important part of the economic speech, besides what the president is going to do, which is talk about his legislative wins, he is going to put the Republicans really on blast when it comes to the debt ceiling drama. Emory Horton, thank you so much. We'll visit again in the 7 o'clock hour. Our chief Washington uh, correspondent. You know, I, I, I don't know what to make of Washington. It's January, and I guess I've, I have attended the State of the Union. And it's sort of like it's a religious service when you, you go to a church where you've never been before. And it's like a religious service where you're sort of standing around going, okay. And everybody's taking it really, really seriously. But then no one listens to the speech. They just decide when to clap or not clap. That's the only analogy yeah. that I can imagine <laughs> pulling together religion in Washington, D.C. It, it, it was but... like a religious experience. I mean, it's state of the onion, and it's, it's I think, what everybody's riveted on. Well, people want to understand also some of the turmoil after uh, the state of the union is over in terms of who leaves the cabinet and who joins the cabinet of and President Biden. And what the Biden, president will do. And whether he'll indicate whether he's going to run again and how much he'll double down on that. Because if he doesn't, if he's a lame duck, that becomes a real problem in terms of trying to forge some unity. But listening to Anne-Marie there, it's hard to imagine there's much anyway. I, I don't I don't know. What I, what I know is President Trump, they're telling me maybe, maybe he won't run, but he's back on Facebook and Instagram. And it's interesting the Democrats have to respond to that. I don't, I don't really know what that means. Although, if you think about it, if he actually <clears throat> starts posting on Facebook and Instagram... What does he do to Truth Social? And he's trying to push that forward well, and get sort of uh, traction there. Will he come back or will he say, you know, if you don't want me, like sort of a like Roger Marks? I think what he wants to do is get on various and sundry networks. Mr. Trump, I know you listen in the morning. Please come on. Lisa and I would love to have you join us here uh, in Washington. Futures up 10, Dow Futures up 14. Lisa, what do you see on the screen? Germain this morning. Oil prices, I think, are really interesting. They're coming up a little bit, but natural gas in the U.S. below three dollars for the first time, going back to early 2021. <clears throat> it's a 70 percent decline. The whole discussion about disinflation is this really a discussion about oil right. and gas coming down? And I keep going back to that. I mean, how much is that really going to be something that we look back on this first half of the year and, to, and say? I'm going to notice yuan. We have not talked. You mentioned China with Anne Marie, 6.79 yuan. Per dollar, I am. It, I just stunned to see how weak dollar evolves given China recovery. We've had a number of people. It's now. It's not now a few. We have many people now modeling five percent GDP, double our GDP in China. How much of the money though stays in China versus goes out well, to the rest of the, the world? Yeah, yeah, I mean, and you're starting to see some of it flow out, but how much? Well, where that's flowing to is the equity market. I'm not there in the triple levers all cash fund. Guess what? VIX 23 ish. Eight weeks ago, we're down to a 19.23 on the VIX. Here within a bull market or a bull rally in a bear market or a bull this and a bear. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. Bloomberg Surveillance, Jonathan Farrow with an important conversation in London. We have conversation here as well to start your day on an economic-driven Thursday. Uh, Lisa Bramwitz and Tom Keene, before we get to Liz Ann Saunders, we got to talk about the ex-post feel of this GDP statistic. The New York Times headlines today, they think it's going to come out maybe even more robust than the Bloomberg survey, which is sub-3%. Can you believe a 3.1% statistic if we got that? Well, 
what is necessarily the importance of that, right? Well, people care if it's post facto or, you know, and this is really the question, right? So if you look at, for example, the leading economic indicators, they suggest something very different in a rapid turnaround. Right. So if it does come in stronger than expected, does it move the markets? Yeah, I got a quick, on the Bloomberg economics screen, and Michael McKee will lead our coverage here at 830. If you add in GP re, GDP real, first guess, with the GDP price index, that gives you a nominal equivalent of a 5.8% nominal GDP, which is not where it was a year ago, which is why revenues and earnings are coming in a but little the, light. But the earnings that we've seen often are really good, and the market doesn't trade on that. It looks at the forecast. It's all what is no, they going don't. forward. I don't agree. What about Microsoft? They no, I, I, they expected. do not look at the forecast. They look at Lizanne Saunders. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Was that a good segue? That was fantastic. Let's do it right now into earnings season. There's no one better <laughs> to talk to and to look at than Lizanne Saunders, Chief Investment Strategist at Charles Schwab. Lizanne, I mentioned nominal GDP there, and as you and I were taught, revenues come in. Is that the region margins are compressed? Yeah. In fact, if you look at calendar year 2022, inclusive <clears throat> of the blended estimate for top line growth for Q4, because of course we're still early in reporting season. Essentially 100% of S&P revenue growth for calendar year 2022 was courtesy of inflation. Um, you know, in real terms, there wasn't any. So I think that's part of the reason why you're seeing these high profile layoff announcements too, is there's kind of a rush to, to right size, particularly for companies that either have a high cost basis or don't have the kind of pricing power that right. keeps that top line growth strong in this disinflationary environment. So, but I agree with you, Tom, I think the outlook in particular in this quarter is more important than what's being reported against a lower bar. Lizanne, what's so important here to me is earnings by earnings to look and Helene Becker folks on air Airlines will be with us today as Alaska Air gives some buoyancy uh, there. I'm looking at the train wreck known as the split up of Dow, Dow Chemical, DuPont. I can't keep track of the symbols. And Dow comes out with earnings, middle in Michigan today. And they say, this is a new one, Lizanne. They're, quote, optimizing labor, unquote. What does the stock market do when we cut costs, fire people, and have some baloney PR optimizing labor? Well, short term, if, if you look at what's happened uh, in terms of the recent big layoff announcements, at least day of, there's been a short term pop in the stock. I'm not sure that that has uh, legs in perpetuity, especially if the rationale behind labor, what what was the term? Optimizing labor. We're uh, opti opti what, what, op optimizing labor. So firing people. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so if it if it's then reflected in more deleterious forward estimates, I think ultimately that's uh, more of a struggle, not just for those companies. I, I think from a market perspective, I like a lot of what I've seen in the latest rally with with you know higher lows, um, internal breath conditions looking better, certainly relative to what they looked like last June when we had the rally. I don't love the the low quality bias to what has happened, but. I think there's still that next hurdle for the market to get through, which is what is, I believe, more downward adjustments to at least the first half of 2023 calendar assumptions, both top line estimates uh, as well as bottom line, which means further compression in margins. This is uh, probably a macro story, but it's also an idiosyncratic story with Southwest Air. We all know what happened with them. Just reporting earnings, the fourth quarter adjusted loss per share, 38 cents versus an estimate of just uh, seven cents. So yes, you could see those idiosyncratic stories coming to the fore amid sort of a, a gloomy overall kind of feel. Lizanne, do you think that the gloom in tech was enough last year to get ahead of the gloom in other sectors? this year for them to outperform? Well, uh, the, I don't think we necessarily have to hope for tech um, bringing leadership uh, back as a as a necessary kind of, you know, prop for the S&P. When you go through cycles, especially when you have these what I call dual cycles, where you, ha you have a bear market, we've clearly had that, you have some sort of downturn in the economy, whether the NBER ultimately declares it an official recession for the books is sort of academic at this point. There are deep, you know, certain pockets of the economy that are absolutely in recession uh, territory. But I, I think it's what uh, sort of happens coming out of that particular cycle. And that tends to bring 
leadership shifts. You see it within the equity market. You don't necessarily see yesterday's leadership. I, I think we're seeing that reflected in areas like industrials and materials, energy on an ongoing basis for some reasons. And I don't know that we necessarily need to see that pickup in tech leadership. It happens across broad asset classes too, with the outperformance you're seeing this year in international after a year where a lot of U.S. investors just said, you know what, why why should I bother to be diversified outside the U.S.? It's sort of the only relative game in town. So I don't know that tech necessarily needs to be the next market leader for the market to do well. So do you think that so far what we've seen in 2023 is a head fake? Um, no, no, I think it's a process. Bottoms are, are processes. And one of the things you want to see, as I touched on, is – even if you retest a low, like we did in October, retesting the June low, the underlying internals, the breadth conditions actually looked better than what we saw in June. And that's part of the process. So I don't think we're out of the woods yet, but I think we're going through that bottoming uh, process. And I, I think, again, there are still hurdles. I think further deterioration in the labor market, mm -hmm. we're starting to obviously get a flavor of that. And in turn, as I mentioned, further ratcheting down of forward estimates. But a lot of the macro pressures are more in the rearview mirror. Listen, we've been here before. The wonderful Ralph Ancapor was on the other day, and he's screaming October low, Dow Jones, big cathartic. I think it was October 19th. Can't really remember. And there's a raging debate about that. Have we hit a low yet? In all of the months that you've been at this, how do you determine a market bottom? Um, wouldn't it be nice if I could say, okay, here are the three indicators. If you can check all three boxes, or then factors. you know you're you're off to the the races. Um, you, well, you often have um, a significant. Uh, pessimism in sentiment indicators. And I'd say that's that's a, what's maybe lacking a bit with the not just the mid-June low, but the mid-October low. And I think the low was, was October 12th. And that could be the low, but um, we we saw the washout, uh, the, the kind of panic phase, but it was concentrated more in the behavioral measures of sentiment. I mean, on the attitudinal measures of sentiment, not the behavioral measures of uh, of sentiment. We we never really got what I always lovingly call the the puke phase. Mm -hmm. We don't necessarily need to get that, but that's one condition sort of this washout in sentiment inclusive of things like fund flows and the put call ratio. Um you know, an improvement in in breadth, underlying breadth. Again, even if you're retesting the lows under the surface, you start to see something a bit better. I think specific to this cycle, right. because this, the weakness has been rolling through the economy and actually kind of rolling through the market. I think we need to start to see stability in areas of the economy that got hit most. And I would put housing right at the top of the list. So yeah, that would yeah. be another macro thing I'd look for is housing stability. And maybe a macro thing off of Fed policy, February uh, 1. Lizanne, this is the key Schwab question. What are we doing with our money? We talk, talk, talk. I'm as guilty of this as <clears throat> anyone. Of course, I haven't reached the puke phase yet myself. Uh, Lisa has. Lisa's reached the puke phase, but I haven't. Six but years what, ago. What, are we, what does Schwab say we're actually doing with our portfolios? Well, what we've seen and what is reflected in things like ETF flows and mutual fund flows is – um, kind of a renewed interest in fixed income again, because there's income in fixed income. There is a risk-free rate again um, for our investors that we see that we're forced out the risk spectrum without really the desire to take on that risk, but just we're desperate for something that was income generating in a portfolio now can move back into relatively riskless um, areas like fixed income. And you're seeing that broadly in fund flows as well. You've also started to see a shift to international. And we, we talked to a lot of clients who are saying, you know, maybe I should have done a little bit more rebalancing so as not to let the international portion of the portfolio uh, shrink. But yeah. Um, real peaked interest in in non-U.S. Maybe no surprise, given that it's done well at least year to date. Real quick, Lizanne, do you think that the go into long duration has been a bit overplayed, given that we really don't know what kind of new normal we're heading back to? 
Yeah, and and you guys have Kathy Jones on all the time, who yeah. uh, you know it's been talking about the ten year being in a range, and maybe you don't want to press longer duration when you get down to the low end of the recent <laughs> range in the ten year yield. But we're also seeing a move back out to long duration equities with you know non profitable tech and heavily shorted stocks. That would be the part of the rally I'd be uh, suggesting you, you you fade to use trader uh, lingo lingo and and stay more focused on shorter duration, which in this kind of environment is higher quality. You know, it just came to mind here. We could have we could have Miss Jones on with with Miss Saunders, and we can have some piano from Miss Saunders, and we can get a double neck Jimmy Page thing going with with uh, Lizanne. Where you would know? this happen? Just a, I don't know, but I think host? a Schwab concert would be in order at the Keen household at Shea no, Keen. No, well, we're or at a, 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 a bar near Lizanne. Lizanne, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> we'll think about nice that. to see you both. Good to see you. Thank you, Lizanne, uh, legendary with Charles Schwab, working of course with the wonderful uh, Kathy Jones. I, I think that was a beautiful paintbrush of where's the catharsis. There's a lot of people with a lot of experience saying, where's the pain? I don't think there's pain because we had this massive stimulus. People are flooding back to big tech. The second that you think maybe rates aren't going to go as high, maybe the economy is not going to be so bad, maybe these layoffs will take care of some of the extra costs. Lizanne pushing back against that, saying, Probably not. This is all part of that sort of <clears throat> bottoming out process, still leaning into materials and energy and some of the other real world economy. You know, how much are people secretly long tech? Blanchard in his new monograph repeats repeatedly through the book about every 30 pages the Biden stimulus. And I think we have underplayed the Biden, you know, whether you want to politicize it or not. But the Biden stimulus is maybe why we haven't seen the catharsis yet because it still is ticking out. And you got all those savings in uh, China that are coming back online yeah, too. We will see. A red and green on the screen right now, important economic data here in less than two uh, hours. Coming up, John Gray of Blackstone. We'll do that in the eight o'clock hour. This is Bloomberg, good morning. Keeping you up to date with the news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In Ukraine, President Vladimir Zelensky thanked the U.S. and Germany for their promises to deliver tanks. The first of the German tanks could arrive within three months. Now Zelensky is calling for allies to provide other advanced weapons. Zelensky says Ukraine still needs planes and long-range missiles. Bloomberg has learned that the mayhem at the New York Stock Exchange earlier this week has been traced to an employee who left a backup system running. Now, that mistake triggered wild market swings involving more than 250 companies. Thousands of trades were canceled at a cost yet to be determined. Scandal-plagued Congressman George Santos says he'll hold a news conference to answer questions about fabricating large parts of his background, but he's not saying when. The New York Republican is also under fire for allegedly hiding the source of donations to his campaign. Chevron plans to buy back $75 billion of shares after a year of record profits. The energy giant also will increase its dividend. All that's likely to lead to more criticism from those who accuse the oil industry of profiteering after Russia's invasion of Ukraine sent energy prices surging. And despite an upbeat annual sales forecast, IBM says it plans to eliminate about 3,900 jobs or 1.5% of its global workforce. The cuts will focus on the employees remaining after spinning off of the Kendrill and Watson Health Units. IBM still expects to recruit in what it calls the higher growth areas. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. Just about everything is worse within the leading indicators, and it continues to suggest that, yes, we are going to have some kind of a recession. Um, we still think that recession is going to be mild. It's going to be brief. But nonetheless, that's going to be the outcropping of the Fed raising interest rates uh, close to 5% 5, 5 uh, within a few months.
Dana Peterson, Chief Economist of Conference Board. She was lights out. Lisa, we got to talk about uh, Ms. Peterson. I thought she was absolutely lights out yesterday on the granularity that's out there in their acclaimed leading indicators. The granularity all adds up to one thing, the short and shallow consensus that everyone seems to be getting around that's fueling a lot of what we've seen over the past couple of weeks. Yeah, my problem with short and shallow is for X percent of the public, it's not short and shallow. For Y percent of the public, it's like, what recession? And then there's an in-betweeny that says, okay, maybe it's a bit harsh. My problem with this is that if you think that your pool is short and shallow and you dive in and it's not, you got a problem. That despises my childhood. I hope not. That sounds horrible. You should see me. Damien, have you ever seen me do a cannonball at the summer party? I have not seen that. I would pay to see that. I would like to see that also. I used to do cannonballs very much. I used to have to cannonball. But in my my age of youth, can't can't open her. It's a dangerous one. I'd rather cover it all up at my age. Oh, boy. (laughs) I'm sorry, sir. How about those markets? The gentleman from Australia says, would the three of you move on right now? Time to put a cork in it. Joining us right now, because we need a brief on the certitude of EM and International. This is their year. Damien Sassar <laughs> joins us. We're going to try to get through the Super Bowl free because he's going to be with us five times before we get to the soiree. You're in right now. Your phone must be ringing off the hook. Off the- what is the question you get? What's the consensus mystery of pros going to Damien? What's different now? Well, it's terms of trade, and it's the better clarity, finally, we're getting on terms of trade. What's largely terms of trade? Because terms of trade is how is the economy actually doing, given the movement in commodity prices? Right, oil and, and copper specifically, right? I mean, a lot of emerging markets are, you know, commodity exporters. So, you know, previously you wouldn't know that, you know, with oil up and copper up, you didn't know if they were benefiting or not from the inflationary dynamic, the growth dynamic we were seeing. Now you're getting a little bit more color. You're seeing the South Africa's, the Chile's, the ones with large commodity exports. I'm talking base metals, I'm talking copper, actually starting to perform better than simply because energy prices are coming off, they can operate more efficiently, and their exports are worth more. So, you know, I think a little bit more clarity in terms of trade goes a long way when you're trying to play in local markets. Let's zoom out and get a little philosophical. This question about copper and some of the metals that have been rallying, does it make sense with you with respect to what's happening in oil and what's happening in the rallies in metals? That's a good question. I think it has to do with the China reopening. And look, I mean, it's justified in a lot of ways, but five out of the last seven years, we know copper's a very volatile base. I mean, look, and, and it's really more a proxy, and I think it's more the fact that you had some very light positioning, some le- very light build-out, which has kind of fueled the recent rally. I don't know how much, le- in terms of legs, it probably doesn't have that much more. But today, right now, what it can do is it can get central banks in places like South Africa, who's going to be announcing this morning, later today, Chile, um, to perhaps pause maybe hike, pause, and then the receivers come on, and that's how you make money on emerging markets. Which is what people have been seeing uh, over at Bank of Canada basically indicating is going to happen on a broader scale. I do wonder, though, the reason why I ask about this divergence, when you talk about terms of trade, the terms of trade for China and what they're actually buying, what they're actually going to buy, how much they're going to fuel the rest of the global economy. What terms of trade are you looking for to understand that? Well, that's the ambiguity, right? I mean, what is China going to do? What does a reopening mean for them? And quite frankly, more importantly than anything, is Beijing going to really rise to the occasion the way they did post-global financial crisis and stimulate all indications point that, yeah, they're going to stimulate, certainly not like they did back in 2009, 2010. But from where I sit... You can't really fight the China reopening right now. It's been a one-way trade. We saw that China just reopened. And by the way, you've been showing onshore yuan. You have to show the offshore yuan. Onshore is not open yet. 674 and offshore yuan. 674, not 679. 674 now. It was at 672 and a half, you know, at the peak this morning. So it's really moving. And obviously, you've got Hang Seng at an 11-month high. So, you know, it's all kind of bold up. I I got like eight ways to go here. But I'm going to go after you insulting me because I'm old school and use onshore uh, (laughs) renminbi. And, you know, including the battle over is it Remimbi or Yuan. Damien Sassar, whether you're going to go onshore or offshore, the massive mystery here is follow through. For example, folks, follow through on strong Renminbi. Or I, you can do this, folks, on the on the Bloomberg. I just lots did Chilean, and lots of Bloomberg's. Chilean peso. <laughs> Thank you. And I did Chilean peso back in the dollar boom that we've had. And we've come in and we're plus one standard deviation, strong Chilean peso on a seven, eight, nine year trend. Great. Do you perceive follow-through of stronger CLP 
follow through of stronger CNH. Well, I think the real, well, CNH is different than CLP because you have a constitutional referendum coming up in Chile, which is going to skew things significantly. So you really have to be mindful of the timing you put these types of opportunities on. <laughs> in China, CNH, I mean, look, at some point, Beijing's not going to like the appreciation. There's no question. But right now, they don't give any indication that they're doing that. And with the yen, remember, the yuan is competing against the yen for exports. So, <clears> you know, so long as the yen keeps rising and all indications point that that's not ending anytime soon, yeah, I can see some more, you know, runway for the yuan yeah. to appreciate from current levels. I want to talk, you mentioned receivers. You're talking about Rece the options market. Buying receivers. bonds because rates are high. And so you're oh. receiving in rates when they're, oh. you know, at this level. I thought when he said on receivers, I thought he meant A.J. Brown and the Eagles. <laughs> Who's got the best receivers of the four teams in the Super Bowl? Oh, okay. So what are we talking? Philly? Philly's got great receivers. I, um, that's what I was going to say. I think it's A.J. Brown Those and Devontae Smith. Those are your receivers. I mean, Kansas City, I mean, I don't know how they've been doing it. It's all Mahomes. I know how they've been doing it. Uh, Cincinnati, though. I mean, the Bengals have great receivers. In the, they T. Higgins. In, in the snow, they were magical. Jamar Chase, yeah, they were unbelievable. By the way, I just want to point out, it took four minutes. You started by saying, we're not going to get to the Super Bowl. We're not going to get there. No, he's, he's speaking English, and he's like, that reminds me of the Super Bowl. <laughs> Damien has one, one effort. <laughs> Jargon. Okay. I get good with jargon. What in God's name is a receiver in this ass hour world? Uh, Jamar Chase is a great wide receiver. I'd love to have him on my fantasy. No, come no, on. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Well, there's and payers and there's receivers, receivers, and there's receivers in, fi in, fi right, in, sw in swaps. So when you're paying in swaps, it means you think interest rates are going to go higher. So you're basically going to pay. So I don't want to own yields at this level. I want to own them later on. If you're receiving in swaps, it means I like yields at this level. I'll receive that all day long thinking interest rates are going to come down right. because people are buying bonds. I understand why you went to the Super Bowl. CFA, now I understand. I do want to just go broad. Mr. Brown. <laughs> exactly. <clears throat> just, uh, you know, you mentioned Chile, and I, I live there, and I've been to the Antofagasta oh, area, go, and Antofagasta. I am wondering, well, no, but this I really does go to the... Peloton. <laughs> this goes to the sort of real economy <laughs> question. How much do you lean into that? Is that really the trade when it comes to emerging markets, the mining, the, the commodity producers? It, you know, I, correlation certainly between between the Chilean peso and copper, you know, had diverged for a period there during the COVID crisis. They've converged again. They are tracking pretty closely once again. But, I mean, these jumps due to, you know, the political situation there is something you have to be mindful of. And any real practitioner is going to be very mindful of it. And they know exactly when the next election, you know, whatever's coming on with the referendum. I don't know any of that. I'm going to be full disclosure. What I do know is that Chile has more copper reserves than anybody on the planet. And so if you are it's certainly looking for some sort of relationship between the currency and commodities. That's yeah. where you're going to look. So then how come you're pushing back a little bit against some of the wholesale optimism diving into emerging markets and this idea of short and shallow? Because we've come very far, very, very fast since October. And like all things, yeah. emerging markets overshoot to the downside. They overshoot to the upside. And I'm just mindful of the fact of the speed of the move. And so I wouldn't feel comfortable as a fiduciary telling my investors to go headlong into the you know emerging Are markets. They? Is that what the flow says right now? Well, I I think the doing smart what you money I've seen every time. I think, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, they are. Yes, I mean, the speculative money for sure. Um, the retail money definitely. But I think it's really the the smart money, the institutions. All they're doing is pulling back on their dollar hedges. It doesn't mean they're taking them off. It means they're going from 75 to 50, and that's really they the difference. They have not made the bet in EM International yet that you and I have witnessed from, from time to time. The pain is not there yet. And I'm told people start feeling the pain. Can you see Lisa like, you know, Lisa's so cool. She knows so you cool. don't wear Patagonia in Chile. <laughs> She'd be there with the alpaca thingy. You know, the poncho thing. Do you know that the there's thing? one highway, or there was when I was back there, and a bunch of alpaca blocked it because there was a herd of them that was going across the main highway, and all the cars had to stop until the alpaca were done? I heard you can ski off the wrong mountain, and the next thing you know, you're in Bolivia, and that's a big problem. I mean, like, I'm just saying, I've heard some really horror stories about people who've gone there skiing, think it's going to be great. They get to the bottom of the mountain, and they're in a different country, and it's a problem. Heard that. Damien Sassauer, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your travel tips. I really appreciate it. You know, I got to say, Tom, when we're talking about, uh, you know, the dub money, and I, I hope no one is watching this who might be my progeny, but one of my offspring yesterday said, Mom, I was looking at some tickers, and the double long VIX ETF is doing really well. Should we just pile yeah. all in? Tell I them to like, take no. a receiver on it. <laughs> Damien Sassar, brilliant. What you just heard there, folks, I'm into hilarity, is really, really important. It's a huge mystery into the first part of this year. The idea idea of does this international EM enthusiasm that Mr. Sassar lives every day, does it really have a spirit and legs? Jane Foley really pushed against it yesterday with John in London. A lot of people are saying maybe it's gone too far, just to your point, even though the story is still there.
wisdom. Coming up, we look at the receivers of the San Francisco 49ers. Stay with us. Red and green on the screen. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. in probably the worst economic outlook that maybe we feared a few months ago, but things aren't good. Just about everything is worse within the leading indicators, and it continues to suggest that, yes, we are going to have some kind of a recession. The market has been buying into this far better than expected story for Europe. We have basically a call for a recession in the U.S. starting in Q3. Everyone is saying, look, earnings expectations are still too high. I don't disagree with that, but I disagree with the sequencing. I disagree with the timing. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow in London, I should say. Lisa Abramowitz and Tom Keen in New York. And those are the conversations we are having in January. It's just really certain we're going to kill this in the opening segment here, Lisa. The whole idea of 2002 uncertainty and somehow this path that we're on to becoming certain. To becoming certain of optimistic views. And that, to me, is really the tone. And at what point do you push back against that? Because the certainty of the first three weeks of 2023 <clears throat> is up and longer. And it's resilient in that there have been, just, to, just in the last three weeks, I would say, there have been real tests of down and down quickly. And then, you know, whether it's at 10 a.m. or 2 a.m. or 2 p.m., whatever the news is, boom, a bid finds the market. Do you buy into hope or do you try to get a gut check and understand where perhaps people and the consensus could be wrong? Because if the market is going to maximize pain, where yeah. is it going to be? A resurgent <clears throat> dollar, tech selling off in a massive way, long-end well, yields going up, all these ways that people are basically discounting. We're supposed to give you bow tie stuff on economics. We've got that important data coming out in 90 minutes. Michael McKee will lead our charge on the first look at Q4 GDP. What we got to do is go earning center here, and it's just real simple. I'm looking at the red headline, American Airlines, and I'm not going to badmouth anybody. You can perceive where your favorite airline is. 189 was the estimate, and they come in large with a 250 to 350 looking out this year. That's a big lift for American Airlines. I mean, have you bought plane tickets recently? Do you know how much they're charging, how much yeah. they've gone oh, up? Yeah. And yeah. there you go with the margins. And people like those <clears throat> margins. You're not seeing the margins in other areas the same way, like Tesla. But you right. are seeing the margins in uh, travel and experiences. How beleaguered is the Roberts family? Comcast, they own the Death Star. Uh, we say good morning to them. And the answer is Comcast raises a dividend. And that's the use of cash that's out there that is that big mystery this year. And we've seen that in the energy space as well, in terms of buying back shares and giving out dividends. And we have seen that on the margins. You of cash going to uh, really investing in the infrastructure, also, though, still strong. So at what point does this really come to a margin story? You're not seeing it in the airlines. You are seeing it in some of the other industries in terms of how much they're just seeing their profits go down. John Gray with Chanel Bassick. We'll do that in the next hour, I think later in the hour, based on Mr. Gray's schedule. And Dawn Lim reports for Bloomberg News that it's a Jonathan Gray saying Blackstone. And they've got their real estate thing going. they got a lot of things going on. Let's be direct about it. And the headline is they missed their forecast for running $1 trillion. I like what Mr. Gray says. I'm more focused on returns, which seems to be the theme for corporations this year. How much can you just double down on what you believe in? I want to ask him, though, about real estate in particular, because they've bought so much into the real estate world. Yeah. And you've got the institutional investment uh, portfolios. Do they sell? Do they lean into that? How much can they yeah. raise r rents at a time when a lot of people are pushing back real estate, those costs? Quote, real estate bets took hits in the fourth quarter. Hits, they say, with opportunistic bets depreciating 2%. Core investments down 1.5%. We'll have uh, Mr. Gray with us uh, later. Let me do the day to get through it quickly. Not much to tell you. After the good day yesterday, a surprise 24 hours ago turned out great. VIX 19.23 and nicely. Futures red and green on the screen. Futures up nine uh, right now. I'm going to call it a bid. BitDog near 23,000. The yield space gives me nothing this morning. 3.48% on the 10-year yield. Oil's given back a few dollars here. Gold 19.53 an ounce. Good morning, Dennis Gartman. Spoke to him yesterday. No surprise, he's long of gold. I mean, that's what Dennis Gartman would tell you. But he made clear it's a conundrum market. He can't make sense of it. 
I just look Which forward to the time important. when you pull up the bit dog screen and it barks at you on the Bloomberg terminal. Taking a look <clears> at what we're looking at today, 8.30 a.m., like uh, the fourth quarter right. U.S. GDP is really the highlight. And within that, some of the granularity, core PCE for the fourth quarter, that's what I'm looking at. Because, yes, it is about growth, but it also is about the deceleration and inflation that has fueled a lot of this optimism that we've seen Can about we, short and shallow. This is great. This is on radio. This chart looks spectacular. And the bottom line, Lisa, that's a great 30, 40 year chart of core PC, which shows how unusual the pandemic was. Exactly. And are we going back to what we knew before? At 1 p.m., we get U.S. selling $35 billion of seven-year notes. The past two auctions have been really good, which is a notable uh, divergence from what we saw at the end of last year. Do you see that in the belly of the curve in some of the areas that are probably less liquid and maybe less sought over or maybe more so if people are looking for that yield, that income that they now see as uh, uh, attractive? And aftermarket, the earnings role continues. Intel will be the latest. Very curious about the chip sector. What kind of forward look do we get? Intel shares are lower by more than 42 percent over the past 12 months. Micron and Qualcomm down more than 20 percent. Have we baked in the bad news, Tom? And that really, to me, is some of the theme that we have seen over the <clears throat> response to earnings and the results that we've gotten so far. Right to it now as we speak to Liz Ann Saunders about the reality of the equity markets. We take a broader view with Philip Campariel, portfolio manager, J.P. Morgan Asset Manager this morning. I love, love, love your notes. Single sentences, <laughs> observations, weaving it together together and your major weave is the epsilon in the back of the equation uncertainty is going to be less uncertain and we're going to get to certainty when does jay powell have certainty he has it right now tom i, I and i think the, the the key to our view is first of all Good riddance to 2022, because as an asset allocator, Tom, what Powell and his friends did last year was create really, really tough ways to manage risk. As an asset allocator, we love that if stocks go down, you better have bonds as your defense on the other side. And the most risky balance funds last year were the more conservative ones. And when do we ever say that, right? So the 13% drawdown in the Barclays Ag, the Bloomberg aggregate, I'm sorry, was, was, the, was the worst year that we've ever had. Now, going forward, you asked me the question, when does Powell have certainty? It's right now, because they're going 25 basis points on February 1st. And we haven't been able to say that for a well, long time. Well, the chart that Lisa showed there on PCE inflation, mm -hmm. we see that. Is it 830, Lisa? That's at 830. We see that. Yep. Well, I'm sorry, it quarter. magnificently shows the one-off of this pandemic. Yep. Does J.P. Morgan, across all your platforms, suggest we are beyond the pandemic? Or beyond the pandemic highs in inflation, for sure. Right. So that's why we're going to this step down in the aggressive in the aggressive tightening stance. Tom, last time I was here, it was at the end of, you know, the at the end of the third quarter. And I told you we had a record high in our fund in cash. That is not the case anymore. We are putting money to work all over the world. We only have two percent in cash right now. We're stopping short of saying that we're going to see an earnings acceleration or an, or a reignite a reignition of the cycle. But we are putting money to work in the U.S. specifically. We have a 20 percent allocation to invest in great corporate bonds. That's the most we've ever had in our portfolio. And we have about a nine percent relative value trade between U.S stocks and non-U.S. stocks. And we, we haven't had that since 2017, Tom. Like, mm -hmm. this is about being active and taking advantage of opportunities again after last year. Investment-grade bonds in the U.S. Yeah. have gained about 4% so far this year. Yeah. That is akin to what we've seen in the S&P 500. At what point yeah. do you know the trade is up, that the gains are in, that basically you've been yeah. on it, you've ridden a good ride, it's over? Yeah, so, Lisa, we are, we are looking for it more for carry. What does that mean? It means a yield story. If we were really optimistic about the U.S., we would be in the U.S. equity market, because we have that option as a balanced portfolio manager, rather than an investment grade credit. So the credit story, Lisa, is to get us more yield than our index. What I'd say where we're trying to get total return is the non-U.S. equity equity market. So the way that we would go back into U.S. equity would be, okay, core PCE is falling like a rock. The federal funds rate doesn't need to be at 5% anymore. And what the Fed is saying for 2024 is going to happen in the back half of this year. That is not what we're saying. Does that mean that in the U.S., when people do start going back, <clears throat> energy is going to be the leadership, continue to, a uh, uh, sort of a redux of last year, because that is also a yield story. That is also a dividend play. Yeah, so um, I think if people were to go back into the U.S. equity market, it wouldn't be in those yield plays. It would be in the total return beta stories, you know, the, the growth stories that were plagued last year when interest rates moving higher. So when people continue to go back into the U.S. equity market, I think it'll be at a time 
when growth stocks are back. Because, we're not, again, we're not talking about a reacceleration of growth. We're talking about a more subdued growth environment. And, and in, that, in that environment, I think the big cap tech stocks can do pretty well. You talk about core PCE dropping mm-hmm. like a stone. And yep. there was a mantra over the past decade, don't fight the Fed. Yep. This year, it's fight the Fed because the Fed is wrong. <laughs> Do you buy that? They're not wrong. I think they go another 50 basis points and then they go on hold, right? So but that, do they cut rates by the end of this year, which is what we're you're not, seeing in yeah, futures. Yeah, so we're not willing to say that yet, Lisa. I think that's a little premature. And I think Jerome Powell, to your question earlier, Tom, <clears> I think Jerome Powell may push back on that with open mouth operations on February 1st, which could be a we, risk, which again, Lisa, is, is about why we're more <laughs> in the IG credit side than in U.S. equity. The opportunity for equity is overseas. There's right a now. constant theme of the people that we have conversation with that the market is out front of the Fed. Mm-hmm. What are J.P. Morgan clients actually doing? Are they, are they telling you they want to be in the market, or are they, as a generalization, scared stiff? Tom, every conversation that I'm having right now is about, should I be looking outside the U.S.? And it's like the twilight it's the vote. zone. It's like the twilight zone because we've been asking people to do that for a long time. And right now, I think the opportunity is, listen, as Yogi Berra said, You'd rather be lucky than good. And in Europe, they have a three standard. Was Yogi view. Bear a professor at Fordham? <laughs> <laughs> when you come to a fork in the road, take it. Carry <laughs> yeah, on. Exactly. So Europe had a, th- Tom, Europe had a three standard deviation warm winter. This is the warmest winter they've had in a decade. Well, you mentioned that. And, you know, we just did with Damien Sassar, EM, commodities, yeah. copper, Chilean pesos out. It's a three standard deviation move. Yeah. Negative two standard deviation, strong dollar, weak Chilean peso, mm-hmm. bombing through to a plus one. Does EM pause here or is there an urgency to get on board EM and international? Yeah. So, listen. EM is the most volatile asset class on the planet, right, that we deal with. So I think the ways that you manage risk in EM, we're just buying calls on the index. So if it goes up like it did this year, we're going up with the market. But if the market tanks, then we're going, we, have a, we have a limited downside with our premium. So we're buying calls on the index. That's the way that we're controlling for near-term volatility. But remember, in 2021, when everybody was talking about how great the equity market was doing, EM got crushed in okay. 2021. So there's still, even with the rally, a Value, a, a longer term valuation uh, component. I'm running out of time. I want to talk to you about Toyota and investment in Japan. You got to come back and do that, you know. <laughs> Br- you know, bring your Japanese team. Toyota, Lisa, Toyota down 31% in US dollar terms from the beginning of last year, like 12 months trailing. We can talk about automakers yeah, coming up. Phil um, Camparelli. Are flying because thank the Bank you. of Japan is even moving. So okay. Are flying. Well, uh, Phil Camparelli, thank you so much. With JP Morgan Asset Management. Red and green on the screen, futures up 10. Good morning. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Russia has launched a major barrage of cruise missile attacks against Ukraine. Authorities there say the attacks were aimed at energy infrastructure and other civilian targets in Kyiv and other cities. The assault happened a day after the U.S. and Germany promised to supply Ukraine with tanks. That gives Ukrainian forces a significant upgrade. Meta Platforms is reinstating former President Trump's Facebook and Instagram accounts after a two-year suspension. His accounts will be subject to what the company calls guardrails, and there will be specific penalties for rule-breaking. The former president was reinstated on Twitter in November, but hasn't posted there yet. Business confidence in the U.K. has sunk to its lowest level since the global financial crisis. That's according to a survey from the Institute of Chartered Accountants, which cites inflation and weakening customer demand. Companies in the retail property manufacturing sectors were particularly downbeat. Southwest Airlines posted a larger-than-expected loss in the fourth quarter. The carrier's scheduling meltdown over the holidays when thousands of flights were canceled will cost about $800 million. Now, Southwest says an increase in flight cancellations and a deceleration in bookings this month will lead to a first quarter loss. And Asia's richest person, Gautam Madani, is fighting back. The business empire he controls is considering legal action against activist investor Hindenburg Research. That firm accused Adani's business of market manipulation and accounting fraud. The Adani empire lost $12 billion in market value on Wednesday. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg.
These tanks are meant to help Ukraine fight effectively uh, on open terrain to defend their sovereignty and their territory and to win back territory that the Russians have taken from them. It's about coordination. It's about the, the unity here and the resolve that, that we all have together to help support Ukraine. Not another suit and tie. He will always be Admiral Kirby. He is out of the Newport Officers Candidate Program on the Forrestal, serving in missile systems on big ships before handling public relations across so much of the Navy and the Pentagon. He's with Strategic Communications and National Security uh, Council. We're going to get right to it here. Lisa Bramlett and Tom Keene in New York. John Farrow uh, in London. We'll get to John here uh, down the road. Big economic day in an hour and 15 minutes. Stay with us for that. But now, Anne-Marie Horton. Anne, I want to, Anne-Marie, I want to go, excuse, Anne, I want to go a different tact here, but I really got to sit on Kirby as well. What does the Pentagon think of the debate in the media over tanks? What I see is loads of people who've never been near a tank, wouldn't know one if it came down the street. Their complete knowledge is Bill Murray in, in, in one of his movies there, Stripes, from years ago. What do the pros think about the tank debate? Well, I think it's not really a debate that started because of the media. It started because we have seen a reversal from this administration. They were steadfast that they would not be sending these high-tech Abram tanks. They talked about that these are massive gas guzzlers, that they are logistically very difficult. The supply chain to make sure that these tanks operate is also difficult in a place like Ukraine. The training that's involved, they said it just didn't make sense, and that you have all of these hundreds of leopards in these NATO countries close to Ukraine just send them. What's interesting and the new ones on the tanks right. that you really need to look at is the fact that they are not sending the tanks that are already made. They need to build these tanks from scratch. So the end date on when these Abrams get to Ukraine, <clears throat> we do not know. Okay, it's going to be out there somewhere, certainly with all the uh, reporting. As I believe Lyle Brainerd, when she was at Wesleyan, did some tank training for ROTC. We'll have to check that source uh, as we can. Day two, the Brainerd mystery here. I've seen some terse <laughs> notes from economic pros, like adults, with the appropriate parchment. They've got the appropriate jobs, basically saying Brainerd is nuts if she gives up the vice chairman. Discuss. Well, I think that's that's up to an opinion, right? I mean, Lael Brainerd, her term is up at the Fed uh, early January 2026, so this really won't do any harm for her. If she was to step into this role, it also sets her up nicely for a potential future for a Treasury Secretary, yes. right? We know she was on the short list to be the Biden Treasury Secretary. Okay, he right, obviously Amory, went Amory. with Janet Yellen. What's, so, what, Lisa wants to get in here. What's the date calendar of a comfortable transition from Yellen to Brainerd. Inform us. Tom, this is a this is a question that, you know, a lot of people talk about, but we don't know. The reporting we have is Secretary Yellen is committed to the job and she wants to stay on, definitely through the debt ceiling <clears throat> and through the end of the term. Potentially that can change though. Obviously things do change. I don't think you're gonna see a shift at the Treasury until definitely after the debt ceiling drama is over with. So that brings us to at least um, the fall of this there year. There we go. Let's talk about the position that Lael Brainerd could potentially fill if she is chosen. The position that Brian Deese has been in and where he really was one of the most vocal about the SPR and what the uh, the administration was doing with respect to oil. Yesterday, Chevron uh, reported that it's going to have a $75 billion share buyback plan. You've seen record profits from the oil majors. And the White House yeah. <laughs> doubling down, saying it's an odd way to show that the company was trying to increase oil production. Is this gaining any traction at a time where the White House might be working against the market, pushing up prices with refilling the SPR next month? Well, the president has been scolding the oil companies for months. So this statement, although it seemed maybe quite harsh for some in the oil industry, is not a surprise at all. Chevron's coming out with a $75 billion buyback. The administration maintains that they are reaping profits as Putin invades Ukraine, and that had a surge in energy prices. And what they want, and have they been wanting for months, is for oil companies 
to be able to produce more so that they are less reliant on having to go ask neighbors. Obviously, this has been a tense debate in Washington. Republicans say that this administration has been at times hostile to the oil industry. Um, there's new data that actually shows that the Biden administration allowed more drilling in their first two years than the Trump administration, but there's still the issues of Keystone Pipeline and the likes. But you still have individuals in Congress, especially, obviously, on the Democratic side, calling for things like a windfall tax on big energy. So this is something that still very much resonates in the West Wing. So going forward, what's the policy going to be? Do you have a sense of the uh, refilling of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve and what this administration sees as the most important kind of uh, security issue there to protect against possibly another disruption? Well, looking at today's prices, Brent crude, 8694, WTI, 8089. I don't think the administration will be filling up the SPR at these prices. I think they would like to wait to see there's a little bit more of a collapse. But the issue, of course, is that when you talk to analysts, all they see is oil prices going higher. And a lot of this just comes down to the question of how China opens. Is it a messy Chinese, China economy open, or is it going to be very much so a clean one? But we already are seeing higher demand on the roads in China. So it does look like prices are going to go higher. If prices go higher, it's going to be difficult to buy back the SPR, unless they want to do um, a solid for the industry, right? Higher oil prices, that's a time to buy back for, for, for U.S. oil producers. Emery, thank you so Politically much. Politically toxic. Yeah. Emery Horton, thank you. It's a toxic brew. Emery Horton, thank you so uh, much uh, this morning in Washington. I mean, I asked a dumb question here, and I looked it up on the Internet, and, and there it is, Lisa. Okay, they emptied it to the lowest in 38 years, I believe. How, I, now I don't even know what I'm saying here. How long does it take to refill it? It's I mean, a great do you question. go to the gas station? It's sticking the <laughs> yeah, pump. Yeah, exactly. And I, I got mixed stories here, but I, you know, it's like it's like thoughts and prayers, months and years. Yeah, can you imagine? I, I really don't know. Can you imagine? Where's no. Javier Blas with Joe, the <laughs> Joe Biden going to the uh, going to the gas station and just filling up the SPR, <laughs> like plugging it in? This is a real <laughs> issue, especially if they're saying seventy dollars is the bottom. Well, what happens if we don't get back there? Right. I mean, Anna Marie was basically just talking about that. This doesn't seem like an attractive price for them to go in and buy. They said they would start potentially next month. But if they don't, what happens if there is a disruption? Right. And the vulnerabilities of that. Don't and that's you, sort of the pushback that you hear from people. Particularly if you want to win and, you know, the politic, the politics of it. I mean, it's, it's, of course, all of it. Don't you just say, here's the plan and you do a little bit every month. You know, that would be like the same thing to do. Well, right? but what would, the, what would the implication be for oil prices? They've come down a lot. You are seeing these record profits for uh, for the big oil companies, $200 billion for the five big ones. They starved for years. Um, I mean, look at all that. I just did the $75 billion share buyback, which is something in the vicinity of 21% uh, of their market capitalization. I, I'm not going to opine on if that's a lot of money or less. Apple's going to do a share buyback. I'll bet you it's somewhat equivalent with the profitability of Apple. I, you know, speaking so, out of turn here, but is there a moral ob Do they have a moral obligation to return profits or to the point of everyone, do they need to find the investment for the next marginal barrel? highly politicized aspect of the oil. I think that there's also this political aspect of the airlines as they come out with their earnings. Do they yeah, buy back their see? shares? I mean, right now what you're seeing is marginally increasing capacity for this year, which might be <clears> good <throat> news in terms of the supply demand dynamic. But their margins are great. I mean, that's basically what you see oh. other than Southwest. The margins are really good. Mary Schlangenstein reporting here right now. American Air expects top profit estimates with full planes. Bramo left in Atlanta. There's the... There's <laughs> that a, was a different one. I mean, I mean <laughs> you live it. It's out there, folks. Yeah. It's out there right now. But, you know, John... I mean, John travels like rock star. I mean, he just effortlessly <laughs> goes. Everywhere you go, it's a train wreck. You're always sitting in the well, airport. Yeah. Domestic is, uh, you know, going to be really... I mean, you're living turbulent. the dream. <laughs> oh, my gosh, yeah. When your trip to Puerto Rico ends up in, in Atlanta. Atlanta. It's pretty, it's pretty get awesome. The, get out of the beach chair on the I sidewalk. actually did. I put on, a hat. I put on why, sunglasses. And why the kids am I were, not surprised? Kids were crying. It was Red great. and green on the screen. Stay with us. <laughs> I'm begging. Good morning.
Bloomberg Surveillance, good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow in London, Lisa Bramitz and Tom Keane in New York. Lisa, working overtime today on earnings. I'm going to get to the data check right now real quick. 19.23, Deborah Cunningham scheduled to be with us. She was brilliant on short paper. Her idea of the Austrian 97-year piece is the U.S. two-year 4.15%. We'll get to Ms. Cunningham here uh, in a moment. Paraphrase, Tesla up a solid 10 bucks. Give me the quote for TV here on Tesla. Help me out there, Chris. Uh, if you can. And then we got Intel coming up later tonight. Tesla uh, uh, up nicely. And we got Intel coming Six up later. 6%. Up 6%. Shares, yeah. Okay, it's a Muskian move. And then uh, Intel coming out tonight, the 10 year per year return on Intel, a jewel of my youth, is 3.1% per year. That is the challenge of Intel. We're going to slow down here. Complete earnings summary, Lisa Bram, let's go. <laughs> well, I want to start with armchair analysis of the airline sector, because we've been getting all of the airline uh, data out, and it is a tale of two airline stories. Domestic travel having a little bit more trouble, the business travel, the business class travel doing a lot better. And we've seen that with Delta. We've seen that with the others. Uh, Southwest obviously had their debacle, which led to a bigger-than-expected loss, as expected to, clean, uh, to go over to the first quarter uh, this year. 2.6% decline. American Air, on the flip side, up 2.3%. And you can see that JetBlue also domestic down uh, nearly a percent after earnings. But how much is that the story, Tom? Really, that business travels back, people are going international. Are they saying That's domestic where the money. business is back, or is domestic business Zoom Airlines? When you have, well, domestic travel had been back, but that arguably is the sector that might be more affected by a decline in overall uh, consumer okay. sentiment and ability. <clears throat> the others that I'm looking at, Sherwin Williams uh, came out, and that's the paint company, and they gave some pretty negative guidance. Those shares down by more than nine percent, and I do wonder how much this is also tied to home building and what's going on there, given all of the concerns around what's going to be happening uh, with mortgage rates. Chevron, we were talking about them earlier with a $75 billion share buyback. Those shares up about 3%. And IBM, just <clears throat> talking to your point about Intel, where is the bar for Intel? Has it already been set oh, so low? It's... IBM actually hurdled over <clears throat> a lot of the expectations on both the actual profits and right. the guidance. Those shares lower by 2.3% because they outperformed last year. That's what people are I... saying. And so the bar was different. The valuation was a little bit higher. That, to me, is a takeaway there. Are you done with earnings? You got more. I'm done. Okay, this is important. This is really important, folks. And this is about the humility and what we do with our guests here. When you have on a legit, legit legend, whether you agree with them or not, like Ralph Ancapora or Lizanne Saunders. Lizanne was on Wall Street Week. She's like 14 years old. She was still in high school somewhere. But anyways, you've got these people there with a lot of experience. And what they're seeing is strategic plans and models blow up like Mr. Roberts and Comcast now with the losses they're publishing on Paramount uh, Plus. They're brutal. $800 million, I believe, is the takedown of profitability there. Or like on Intel, which we all remember as a sterling, you know, John busts my chops about the Dow. It was the mother of all Dow stocks. Just blown up. It's yep. humbling. Blow up your models too, because right now, is it cloud that's going to be uh, on the front on the, on the front foot here? Is it Chat GPT and artificial intelligence? Where do some of the old tech giants go? For is the Microsoft in the, the next Intel 15 or 20 years out? I'm not willing to say, but that's a humility you got to bring to this. Ernie's Helene Becker again. Helene Becker schedule. Yep. Next. Right. next Helene call. Becker's with us as well. She's going to try and get Bramo a better seat at uh, Hertzfeld when she's uh, stranded in Atlanta. <laughs> Right now, Deborah Cunningham joins us. Last time she was on, it was a public service, Global Liquidity Markets CIO at Federated Hermes. Thrilled you could join us uh, this morning. Deborah, what's going to replace LIBOR? Is it working out? Do you have a day to day short term piece that you believe in? You know, we're getting more comfort with the Bisbee index, Tom. It's, it's you know, the, the Bloomberg short term bank yield index, and it has some um, shortfalls, shortcomings in rapidly changing interest rate environments. So at a point in time when rates were going up very quickly or down very quickly, it lagged by a day or two. Right. Um, but to a large degree, it has a lot of data points associated with it, a lot of different firms associated with it, a lot of different you know, input to that process and its actual trades for the most part um, based on actual trades. So we're pretty comfortable right. that that can be something that is a good 
you know, bellwether at this point going forward. What does your world, after your long-term two-year yield, 24 months, what does it say new to Jerome Powell? It says that his job may be slowing, um, you know, the economy. It may be keeping inflation in check, but really he's not being heard that that's going to take more than just another month or two. Um, you know, so if you look at, at at the Fed Funds futures rate, it still is showing, you know, a terminal rate of around 5%. So that's, that's, that's on par. That's kind of what they're telling us. Um, but then where it gets wrong, where the, the market has it wrong, I think at this point is looking into the second half of 2023, Two 25 basis point cuts, 50 basis points less by the end of the year, you know, below the terminal rate. And I think Powell needs to, you know, in his press conference next week, emphasize that longer really means longer. It doesn't mean longer in days and weeks. It means, you know, months and quarters at this point. Mohamed Alarian just put out a column on Bloomberg Opinion saying that in order to get ahead of just what you're talking about, this market misperception from your vantage point of a Fed that's going to cut rates in the second half, that they should raise rates by 50 basis points despite the sort of groundswell of 25 next week. Do you agree? I agree. I, I've said that before, but I don't think they will. Certainly, the Fed speak. You know, before we head in, we headed into the the silent period. Now, um, was definitely you know centered around twenty five basis point a twenty five basis point increase, and you know the focus of that was on the most recent inflation data. I guess if we had you know maybe a PCE number that that you know, printed way out of line that could potentially lead to 50. And although Powell didn't necessarily talk about 25 or 50, he didn't deter others from going the 25 basis point route. So I agree with Alarian. I think that 50 would be a good wake up call to the marketplace. I don't think that's what they're going to do, though, based on Fed speak. Deborah, based on that, what is the bleed through into markets if you think this is what they should do and yet they won't? You know, I think, again, you've got to get to a point where inflation doesn't keep rearing its head. Um, we have certain things that seem to be under control now from, from an inflationary perspective, or at least going in the right direction. But there are other areas of both goods and services that are not in that ballpark. And I think the danger is um, you know, we have to go higher in rates and it lasts for longer than what the Fed is even looking for and wanting for. And what the danger is, is recession from that type of an environment. Are you seeing any sense of a danger of a debt ceiling deba debacle in the short term financing markets? Or do you expect that to come later in the year or not at all? You know, right now, it's just a lot of talk. We answer a lot of client questions. Um, it's it's confusing uh, to investors in the marketplace. Um, but when you look at the yield curve, there's enough uncertainty about what an X date would be probably, you know, between mid-June and mid-August. So two months worth of, of information that's uncertain at this point, um, that it's not causing huge amounts of issues in the marketplace, where it right. mostly is hitting in the supply side right now. We have a lot of supply in the bill market, which is a great thing for short-term rates. Um, but that will be cut back drastically, probably starting in March or April, mm. you know, depending upon what receipts are at that point. Deborah, one of the great municipal projects projects of my ute was a Pennsylvania turnpike. It was a miracle of God through the rough Appalachian Mountains. Federated lived that uh, out in Pittsburgh. Yesterday, we had a 26 million, excuse me, 26 year, $12.7 billion project launch at the wonderful Grand Central Station in New York. It's going to be a 22-minute ride from Long Island instead of going to Penn Station. Frankly, folks, Lisa knows this better than me. This is the vision that's out there in municipal finance, Deborah. Is the vision going to be there in the coming years for these big projects? You know, Tom, I think the vision is good. I think the infrastructure needs um, of this country and certainly New York City are massive. Um, and the municipal market will be a mode for financing that. Short-term munis, though, as well as long-term munis right now, are very subject to, um, you know, sort of technical factors. They still have a lot of cash that came through from a, from a stimulus perspective. Um, they are working on spending those and put those, putting those toward projects. What 
what I can probably tell you is given that I travel the Tur Pennsylvania Turnpike quite regularly at this point, weekly for sure, um, and there are st it's still a project in the making. I can't believe that the, what did you yeah. say it was, a 26 year is would be the right the right time, the right time frame or for, for this this project well, and its considerations. We love in New York what they did with LaGuardia. They did it, what did they do it? Maybe built, rebuilt LaGuardia in what, six months? <laughs> Something like that. Deborah, I'm kidding. Deborah, <laughs> do Deborah, they got to rebuild the Pittsburgh Pirates. That's what they really got to do, Deborah. Hey, Deborah we have Cunningham. Cutch back. Yeah, the Deborah, Cutchin's back. Deborah, it's a good thing. Deborah, thank you so much. Deborah Cunningham with Federated Hermes there on a municipal project. I mean, you've lived this. To, 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 folks, for those of you like me that are really not on this, you're in Long Island. You got to go to the Upper East Side or the East Side Midtown. You got to go all the way over to Penn Station to then come back to your daily job. Is that right? Basically, how do you make the New York City train system a little bit more like Switzerland or Germany? $12.7 billion exactly. will get it done. I don't know if it will. I think, though, that there is this real issue. How do you make it more convenient? But is there the will to do that at a time when people aren't going into the office in the same way? Oh, that's a whole different story. Yeah, But where absolutely. are the revenues going to come from if you don't well, have that groundswell behind I, some of that? You know, I, I had a very important lunch yesterday with one of our senior officers, folks. Beverages were taken. And somewhere after the third martini, uh, uh, the, the person said to me, she said, um, uh, what do you think of Davos? And I said, James Gorman, work from home. You had the most important observation that I saw in Davos. Uh, that answer from James Gorman was on fire. Basically saying you can't put the genie back in the bottle, but back to office is the groundswell, and that is where it's going at least three or four days a week. Yet, right. is that enough to get it Don't done, get right? Me. But this is the issue, right? Because, yes, <clears throat> maybe in the banking sector, but is that on a broader base? And then is there a shift to other locales rather than the big cities? This is a real question because a lot of people don't think yeah. we're going to go back to what it was pre-pandemic. You know, my answer is I got an offspring uh, uh, you know, she's got four degrees in, in Hollywood. Her, her major line is, may I help you? And uh, uh, she makes clear work from home ain't happening. She's got loads of friends and they're just isolated in their homes. The well, have you thing. seen also the job listings? A fraction are work from home. The number of people looking for work from home, everyone. <laughs> Basically, yeah. people want it, but it's not there anymore. Lisa Abramowitz with James Gorman of Morgan Stanley. That was something. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In Ukraine, President Volodymyr Zelensky thanked the U.S. and Germany for their promises to deliver tanks. The first German tanks could arrive within three months. Now Zelensky is calling for allies to provide other advanced weapons. Zelensky says Ukraine still needs planes and long-range missiles. Bloomberg has learned that the mayhem at the New York Stock Exchange earlier this week has been traced to an employee who left a backup system running. Now, that mistake triggered wild market swings involving more than 250 companies. Thousands of trades were canceled at a cost yet to be determined. American Airlines is out with an earnings forecast for 2023 that beat estimates. The carrier also posted fourth quarter profit that was better than expected. American says it's still on track to pay off $15 billion in debt by the end of 2025. And a change at the top of Toyota. The Japanese automaker is promoting Lexus president Koji Sato to replace Akio Toyota as CEO. Now, Sato's job will be to guide the company through the challenges of electrification and automation. Toyota, who's the grandson of the company's founder, will become chairman. The number of smartphones shipped in the fourth quarter fell by the most on record. That signals more pain for manufacturing hubs like South Korea and Vietnam. According to research firm IDC, phone shipments fell more than 18 percent. Turmoil in Apple's main Chinese production base may have been a contributing factor. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. In aviation, uh, despite all the macro headlines, it, it feels like really, really uh, as good as it's ever felt uh, in terms of our demand. And you combine that with supply challenges, you know, it, things just look really good.
The pilot, Scott Kirby, he is of United Airlines, where he has piloted himself by many opinions to be the number one performer in the U.S. aviation market. That's open to debate, but good to hear from Scott Kirby here across the Bloomberg uh, network. Without question, this is the interview of the day where we're going to lean forward. I'm going to lean forward to the market. Oh, look at Lisa. Look at the market. I turned away to see about a Google, uh, you know, Google flight, see where I'm going in Europe. The market goes up while I turn away. That's I mean, been the shift. Three That's, days in a row. Yeah, exactly. That's the uh, the point of travel. The gravitational force yeah. seems to go up. Bitcoin above 23,000. I'm getting out at 25,000. Right now in airlines, I'm going to be very quick here because Lisa's really pumped up on the earnings that we're seeing. Helene Becker is with us, senior research analyst who Cowan barely describes it. She and Kai Von Rumer owned the franchise for decades at Cowan, and she provides leadership uh, forward. Helene, I've got an answer. I use as a proxy New York to Paris, but even that price is down from the insanity of six months or eight months ago. It's still stupid money, but it's less stupid. Is international starting to rationalize in the aviation business? We're, we're seeing, um, Tom, very strong international business travel. Um, less so maybe on the, the, the um, leisure, but I suspect leisure travel will pick up um, mid February and then increase through the summer months. The demand is still very strong. And the further we get away from 2020, <clears throat> the more comfortable people feel about yeah. going outside the country. Helene, how much is this a story of international travel just to compensate for what we saw versus a wholesale return to the way it used to be? Yeah, I think um, so, so. I think there are two things going on here. The first is with respect to supply chain, our um, supply chain issues, right, from from Boeing and, and Airbus um, being delayed on delivering aircraft. So you don't have a lot of capacity coming in, which props up price. But then on, on international business travel, um, after all these Zoom calls and people taking calls at midnight or one in the morning, I did a call with a client earlier this week, and it was midnight in his time zone. I don't think that can continue indefinitely. And I think you're going to see an increase in international business travel this year. And especially, you know, as more people feel comfortable traveling and COVID becomes People continue to think of it as being more endemic. So, Helene, what is the new model? Is it basically having half the plane as business travel and the rest sort of sandwiched into the back as you try <laughs> to get some sort of profitability uh, overseas and then domestic travel, just the ongoing mess that it has been? Yeah, so I think, um, to your point, I think the front of the cabin is going to get bigger in the sense of business travel. That's that cabin, and then you're going to get a bigger premium economy. And when you're thinking about long haul, it's the old lean back seats, the reclining seats versus the lie flats. Um, and then you're going to get a smaller <laughs> section in main cabin. And what we're seeing in terms of pricing, to Tom's earlier point, is the prices that would have been in main cabin um, before pre-pandemic are seem to be a little lower, but prices in premium economy seem to be equal to what business travel prices used to be. And business seems to be more like the old first class pricing. So I feel like the price points are going up and um, <laughs> and the mix is shifting, me. which is good. Helene, you're killing me. True story. <laughs> My father died on a 12 hour notice. I had to get on a plane and I flew economy for the first time since time began. The seat was so small. I flew Helene to Portland, Oregon, nonstop sitting on the edge of my seat <laughs> well, but the then, whole way. Okay, it's a so, joke. So then there's this issue, right? I've travel economy all the time and there's the economy and then there's the economy where you have to buy a soda for your kids if you want them to have any sort of uh, drink on a four-hour flight. I'm just wondering, Helene, for the discounters, whether it's JetBlue, which is traditionally <clears throat> uh, the front of that or Frontier, which I was talking about, what's the future for them if the prospects of domestic travel seem to be diminishing with the economic cycle? Yeah. So, so Tom, I'm sorry about your dad first, but oh, the other fine. thing in terms of the pro the the outlook for for those guys, um, they're going to slow their growth. They're going to have no choice. They're not able. It's it's not the 
the hiring part. It's the retention part that's an issue. And then the <clears throat> aircraft, they have to keep growing right. um, and they can't get the aircraft. So I, I think there's always going to be a market for a deep discounter, right? There's a market, if you think about hotel change, there's a market for Ritz and there's a market for Motel 6. Um, and so I think you're always going to have that differential. And I think people will Right. Who've gotten used to traveling will continue to want to travel because that's um, that's what, right. what they do um, versus buying lots and lots of things that they don't really need anymore. So you know, I think we're I think those guys will be OK. I just think the growth will slow. And I think yeah. American Delta and United are going to see very strong international growth and growth in business this year. And, and I would right. just pivot as I'm thinking about investments to those names. Uh, Helene Becker with us, folks, on radio and television. Thrilled to have you here on a big, big earnings day. Uh, she is with uh, Cowan. Helene, just for the record, I keep a track of the business-to-economy ratio of a given flight from L.A. It was 9 to 1, which I never thought I'd see. $9 of business ticket for $1 of economy. It's down to 6.3 to 1 uh, right now is my busy con uh, ratio. Uh, that's uh, Newark to, to uh, LAX, and everybody else has their other ratios. With that said, said, what is the domestic constraint for Kirby, for Bastion and the rest? Is, is, there, is there constraint gates? Is it new airports like the magnificent new LaGuardia? What's their biggest headache to get us back to some kind of normal 36 months from now? Yeah. So the biggest one is infrastructure issues and the fact that at the busiest airports, there's just no space physically to put more aircraft and we're not building more runways. You know, look at you look at Newark Airport. Um, the two parallel runways are too close together to allow for simultaneous operations on bad weather days. So that airport winds up taking extensive delays and, and weather is in blue sky every day. You, you have rain as you did yesterday and operations per hour decline. And then infrastructure issues, the government doesn't want to talk about this, but they did not train air traffic controllers for 18 months during the pandemic. And you've got a lot of controllers retiring. And, and I get very passionate about this because the right. airlines have a hard time talking about it because obviously they're, right. they're, they're dependent on the government for ATC. Right. But the FAA should handle safety and security and, and, and a private corporation should handle air traffic right. control and you'd, you'd get more investment and we'd be in the 21st yeah. century instead of in the, in the 20th 18th century. century with the Wright brothers yeah, exactly. in North Carolina. Uh, Helene, one final question. John from London emails in and says, what's your single best buy? What's your single best buy right now uh, at Cowan? Yeah, um, United, UAL is our top pick for 2023. Um, it outperformed in 2022, and we think because of their international exposure, it will outperform again in 2023. Elaine Becker, thank you so much. Terrific brief there on a day of earnings. She is with Cowan. Again, they own the high ground on this for a year. The other matter, which we really haven't talked about, we don't need to do it now, is Boeing Airbus, the Guy Johnson expertise in London. And I'm hearing more and more percolation about people are like, what's Boeing really doing in terms of innovation? They're so distracted by all these other tangible engineering challenges that they have. Although also how much can they just bank on the fact that all of these airlines, particularly internationally, are going to be increasing capacity because everybody's business class and lining up for the for the different, you know, yeah. different places, the different clubs and the different airlines, the different uh, lounges. Mr. Have you Kurt been on part of that story about how crowded the lounges are and them trying to push well, back I was gonna, on that. I've seen it. I've seen lines stretched out the door. It looks like it's the longest line I've ever, frankly, it's the longest line I've ever seen in an airport. <laughs> so they've got, miles. but now they're trying to sort of delineate the, getting the golds, the platinum members get first dibs, and everybody else, if you're, you know, uh, American uh, Express, you wait in the other line. I, I have had a senior aviation officer off the record tell me it's their single biggest headache. It is a disaster. All this premium thing. I was just taken from, from, um, Iron down to balsa wood at one airline. <laughs> How'd that they work took out? me down. They, they, I'm not kidding, folks. They took me. You know, there's there's platinum, gold, yeah, yeah. copper. You know, the others. Coal. There, coal, <laughs> yeah, and exactly. then you get the steel, and below that's balsa wood. And they just <laughs> that's took me down to balsa wood. So what wood. kind of perks do you get? You, you get. You think if you you know, they Starbucks is over there. You love it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what, I, that's what I get. Helene Becker. That's what we do here. We have conversations with people like the other day. Jessica Reef Ehrlich, thank you so much at Bank of America for attendance. And the great Helene Becker there 
on what the sell side thinks of these different indices. She said that United Airlines. Yeah. You know, she's, with international presence as well. Futures advance. Becker moves the market up 20. Stay with us. Good morning. The hikes we're getting from all central banks, they have a lagged impact and they're designed to create unemployment, designed to reduce demand. Since late April of last year, it's all really been about the central banks. Look at what's priced in for the Fed for the next two meetings. We've got less than 50 basis points priced in into Fed funds now. The ECB's not out of the words. Madam Lagarde's got more work to do and her colleagues have got more work to do. The ECB is likely to hike more, but the question really is, is that in the price now or not? This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, John Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. We've gotten some earnings. Here comes the U.S. economic data dump. Good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on Bloomberg Television and Bloomberg Radio. John Farrow over in London. Tom Keane in New York with myself, Lisa Abramowitz. And in 30 minutes' time, we get the latest read on the fourth quarter GDP, perhaps uh, either confirming or not, this belief, this optimism that we're seeing in markets. Well, much more than that. You mentioned earlier within your briefs this morning, Lisa, the PCE. We see that at 830 as well. I just look at the ECO screen because I'm too dumb at this, and I just count the lines. And I'm sorry it's a 15-line Thursday. There's a lot of data. <laughs> There's a lot of data, and a lot of people are going to be looking at the GDP number. How much did you see the U.S. economy grow faster than people had expected? I'm looking also, though, at jobless claims. One week oh. after another, they're coming in lower than expected, this resilience, and it sort of might kind of bleed into this belief that we're going to see a just complete rollover in inflation. Uh, well, that's what it is. It's a belief in the, in, in the way the price is moving. And Deborah Cunningham, I, I thought, was very good on that. It federated. I'm going to go to Lizanne Saunders uh, earlier, who made it clear she's watching housing. We get new home sales. I think that's near the end of the Pharaoh soiree in the <laughs> 9 o'clock hour. Do you realize <laughs> exactly. he's doing that? It's, I think it's at 2 p.m. in London. 3 p.m., I believe, it starts. Or whatever. I mean, it's like 3 p.m., 2 p.m. I can't keep track of the time. I mean, he's living large over there. <laughs> but the bottom line is you can see a pandemic boom in 2020 on new home sales, one family homes. And then it's just a it's a crater. And the now what is what Liz Ann's looking at in the real estate market. The reason why it's been so difficult to get your arms around what's going on in the economy, as we've seen from the earnings, is such a bifurcated picture. You've got earnings uh, that are really good in certain service sectors and not so good in the industrials. And where does tech play into that? And, and really, that's the story that we've seen, the rolling kind of mm -hmm. recession, the rolling sense of a disinflationary push. And that's really what I'm going to be looking for in this data. I, I, the inflation still the story here, a little bit of economic scare the other day, although it didn't affect... Uh, the market. Let me run through, start the data here, Lisa. Jump on board. Futures advance. Great. It's really become a better market. There's no other way to put it. Futures up 23. Uh, the VIX solidly under 20, 19.21 after yesterday's uh, festivities. Yield market not giving me much. A broad higher yield uh, statement there. The real yield. 1.16%. And I'm sorry, the most important number on the screen for me, Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index, which is screaming accommodation. Especially at a time when the market just wants to go up and we see that uh, time and time again. I just look at that S&P over 4,000 as we get earnings that are a motley picture and yet people, um, uh, well, they do. We're they, still a motley, motley We crew. are. John, save us. John, I miss you. How are you doing over there in London? What are you doing over there? Uh, what did you have for breakfast? my job to save us pretty much every single day. <laughs> just John to be very Farrow. clear. The show starts at 2 p.m. local. 2 p.m. local. 2 p.m. local good morning, time. Good morning once this week. So good morning, good morning at 1 p.m. London time. David Pace joins us now, the head of macro research at AXA Investment Managers. David, great to catch up with you. Good, good afternoon, good afternoon, to be precise. <laughs> About 27 minutes away from data in America. You know the debate right now. It's cuts or no cuts. You're in no cuts. You're in camp no cuts. Tell me why for 23. Well, we think you know, the US economy looks like, we'll see in half an hour's time, that it closed the year a little bit firmer. And we think that that gives a little bit more momentum for the year. So we are looking for recession across the course of this year. But A, we think it's going to be mild. And B, I think, you know, depending on the composition of the data later, it could start later. So you've got a Fed that's seeing the economy that's ending the year stronger. The labor market's still pretty resilient. Um, I think the risks over the next couple of meetings, we think they peak at five in March, but I think the risk is that it, it could be a little bit more than that. And that just pushes the timetable back. So I think, you know, the, the broad story is the Fed will deliver a slowdown in the economy. It will deliver a loosening in the, in the labor market, but it's how quickly it can do that 
on whether or not it wants to ease back this year and we think it probably happens in 24 rather than in 23. Not all rate cuts are created equally. I think that's my frustration with the debate right now. It's the framing of it and I was just guilty of it then. No cuts or cuts. Let's talk about if there are cuts. You can get cuts for one or two reasons. For this Federal Reserve anyway, you can get cuts because we get a soft landing that no longer requires high interest rates or you can get cuts because we get a hard landing that requires much looser policy. Which one is it and why are we not framing the debate that way? Well, I think it's going to be a recession, but a mild recession, so it's a hard landing. But it's not, <clears throat> it's not as bad as it was in the pandemic, it's not as bad as the GFC. We're not looking at the Fed that cuts rates back to zero on the back of this. And at the same time, you've got an inflation story that we think is going to be a little bit stubborn over the second half of the year. We think it's pretty easy to get headline inflation back to sort of three and a half, four by mid-year. It then sort of starts to level off a little bit. And that's when you start seeing the Fed thinking about, well, if the labour market's tight, service sector inflation is going to remain relatively high what do we need to do to keep it uh, or to drag it down into 2024 and it's unlikely at that point that they're going to want to be tightening policy any further so i think it just adds to the view that they hold the, the, the hold the position that they've got for a little bit longer and that adds to the view that we see contraction in the economy investors don't buy this second phase of this effort neil kashgari the minneapolis fed president wrote about this in a blog in early january he talked about the second phase the first phase is you get from zero to four really fast they've done that the second phase is you get to about five he thinks 540 and then you wait what is it about the then you wait that people just don't get well i think part of it is of course what markets are actually doing um, so markets are pricing a mean outcome they're not talking about a central case my central case is we see a recession we don't see cuts until 2024 the risk is you see something deeper and the Fed has to act a little bit more aggressive and the market puts a probability weight on both of those and then gives you something that is obviously skewed to something that's coming off. So I'm not so sure that when we've got 50 basis points or so priced into the market that that is a central forecast of all of the market looking for two cuts this year. I think it, rain, it obviously sort of spreads a, a range of views. It's a very good point. I want to talk about the potential also that this recession gets pushed out even further. Binky Chowder of Deutsche Bank was on the show with us yesterday. Binky published in the last 24 hours and questions whether we should be pushing out this recession call and endorsing the idea that this rally in the equity market we've seen so far year to date, early days, can continue. This is what he had to say about why. He said real household income after falling for a year has grown solidly for the last five months, supporting real private consumption which has continued to grow within its pre-pandemic up channel. What do you say back to that? I think what supported and it does look like consumption was pretty solid in the fourth quarter again we get the data in a bit but it's not necessarily been strong income growth it's been the fact that households have been happy to use their excess savings much more quickly than we thought much more aggressively than we thought so they're drawing down their saving profile much more quickly the question is does that mean that overall there's more excess savings out there if we just underestimated that well and that's plausible and therefore you would see a stronger backdrop or are households just getting through their savings more quickly so we think that savings that have supported consumption in the fourth quarter, the question is how long that can last. We think that what's happening is that they're being used more quickly and therefore at some point as we move into the back end of this year, you'll start to run out of that saving and the saving rate will have to rise a little bit more quickly. And that I think adds to some of the downturn that's coming through. But the uncertainty of timing of recessions is, is, is renowned. Um, it's very difficult to predict. We have probability models that suggest we'll have a recession now but over the course of the next 12 months. So that's why the composition of the GDP number that comes out later is very important to give you the precise time. I want to talk about the significance of 190,000 as well. It seems to me that the most bearish people on this economy right now have to sit there and look at 190,000 and it forces them to question their view on the economy. How do you look at that number? We get another release of claims in a bit. How do you look at 190K? I think we, we see it in the context of uh, also a, a payrolls number and also the employment um, the component of the, the household surveys employment number which has also been resilient. The labour market is more solid at the moment. Now with claims we always get a little bit um, flighty particularly over um, seasonals and seasonals are a question given the big issues that we've had over the pandemic over the last couple of years. So we, we are wary of putting too much weight on just those pay on that jobless claims itself. But taken in the round all of the labour market is really tight at the moment that's why we're thinking of pushing out the timing of our recession back to later this year rather than starting at the start of this year which is what we previously thought to some extent that reflects the dynamic that we've seen in growth 
but it's also obviously a driver going further forward. So the stubborn bear would turn around and say, wait, which is essentially what you're saying. Wait, it's going to change. The labor market data is going to change. You don't think it's going to change that much. We're at 3.5% unemployment right now. You think we could get a recession and only get to what, four and a half? Yeah, so we're forecasting four and a half by the end of the year, which is unusual. I mean, the average recession, if there is such a thing, sees a sort of about a two percentage point increase in unemployment. Obviously, deeper ones, the GFC saw a much bigger shift coming through than that. But we do think there's some um, validity to the Fed's view that on this part of the beverage curve, what we might see is a reduction of the pent-up demand. We might see vacancies fall without the need to see job cuts come through. And that, the combination of those factors, can see wage inflation come down. Now, depending on, on what happens and on what number you take, the last payrolls report suggested that actually average earnings is not far from the golden zone that the, the Fed would be aiming at, say around 3.5%. But of course, in November, it was 5.8% annualised. So we're, again, not putting too much weight on that. So I think, you know, Powell will talk about in the round all the different indicators they look at. The labour yep. market is key for the Fed. The Federal Reserve next week. David Page of AXA <coughs> Investment Managers. David, this was great. Thank you. TK, that's the debate going into the data about 20 minutes away and into the Federal Reserve decision next week. And also the ECB division, John, in the last 24 hours, as long as it's taking you to celebrate um, Australia Day. I mean, I know you went over to Wander in London there and had some uh, Vegemite butter, the whipped Vegemite butter to celebrate Australia Day. But, John, something seriously has happened in 30 hours. The Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index for Europe, in the United States has sharply diverged. Accommodation in the United States and almost a new restrictive tendency, John, that Lagarde has to face at the ECB. But Tom, we talked about this in the past 24 hours. You've just got to compare the incoming data to expectations, the surprise indexes. And it's been pretty clear over the last few weeks that the data out of Europe is coming in surprising to the upside and the data out of the United States has started to surprise to the downside. That's negative. There is a belief that this ECB this year is going to go a whole lot further than the Fed can go. It's a catch-up year for Europe, Tom. We'll talk about the extent they can catch up over the next 12 months. Yeah, I hope you get better weather, John, up Manchester City against Arsenal. I, I, know, I know it's not today, but I just hope the clouds, the London glue. It's freezing, Tom. Clears it's away. freezing. Well, you can Absolutely freeze at Manchester freezing. City watching the dreaded gunners from Arsenal. We'll see. John Farrell in London. He continues with his good discussions uh, there uh, as well. Futures Vans up 18. Dow Futures up 58. John, the 9 o'clock hour. Look for that. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Russia has launched a major barrage of cruise missiles, attacks against Ukraine. Authorities there say the attacks were aimed at energy infrastructure and other civilian targets in Kyiv and other cities. The assault happened a day after the U.S. and Germany promised to supply Ukraine with tanks. That gives the Ukrainian forces a significant upgrade. Bloomberg has learned that the mayhem at the New York Stock Exchange earlier this week has been traced to an employee who left a backup system running. That mistake triggered wild market swings involving more than 250 companies. Thousands of trades were canceled at a cost yet to be determined. U.S. health officials would like to get the frequency of COVID shots down to just one a year. Today, they'll start discussing how to do that. Food and Drug Administration advisors will talk about which strains of coronavirus would be in an annual vaccine and how they would be chosen. American Airlines is out with an earnings forecast for 2023 that beat estimates. The carrier also boasted fourth quarter profit that was better than expected. American says it's still on track to pay off $15 billion in debt by the end of 2025. And a change at the top of Toyota. The Japanese automaker is promoting Lexus president Koji Sato to replace Akio Toyota as CEO. Now, Sato's job will be to guide the company through challenges of electrification and automation. Toyota, who's the grandson of the company's founder, will become chairman. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg.
we have basically, as you know, a call for a recession in the U.S. Uh, starting in Q3, so second quarter, keeping in, uh, you know, in line with the, the recession playbook historically. We have the market going sideways, so that's still 4,500. We have, if the recession happens in Q3, uh, a, a pretty severe sell-off, which would take us all the way down to 3,250. I caught our camera staff taking notes for Bikram Chada. He's chief global strategist at Deutsche Bank. He is the optimist out there. He's moved the timeline out, but Binky has not given way to the gloom that's out there. Futures up 17, Dow futures up uh, 49 right now. No gloom in the last three or four days. It's a market with a bid, Lisa. I was going to say, basically, people have been pulled back from that <clears throat> gloom, and they're basically saying everything's great now. Go head in. Uh, we're going to have to see on that. We're going to pause right now and talk Japan. I've had the immense privilege of attending Japan for Bloomberg any number of times. It's always something unique and separate in the world. And spanning across three generations is a company that started literally in fabric and three generations back said maybe we ought to make cars. They ran into the immense challenges of World War II and they picked their pieces up. His father invented modern Toyota. There's no question about it. And Akio Toyota today announcing his move from president to chairman. I can only say he is extraordinary in the malaise of Toyota that he took over and the moonshot of performance he's done versus other auto companies. We spend way too much time on the dalliance of autos where this guy, literally, Lisa, on a worldwide basis said, we can do this. And the lessons learned from Toyota for all in automobile engineering have been humbling. It's something that we're going to be talking a lot about, people who are sort of the old guard, the legacy, uh, transitioning to a new model in a new era, and Toyota very much uh, in the forefront of that during this transition to electric, to trying to deal with the Japanese economy versus the rest of the world. I will say, it has been interesting with earnings that people are optimistic, but they're not that optimistic. Which uh, is exactly. Reason, yeah. I just we, we don't talk between the set. Lisa and I can't stand each other. I was thinking exactly the same thing so maybe we should three or four more. minutes ago. <laughs> okay. It's like a tweak quarter. Yeah. BMO Capital came out on IBM, and they tweak like four dollars or six dollars <laughs> we're tweaking but tweaking is a good thing if you do investment grade credit i mean this is the interesting Stop thing talking but to this me. is okay <laughs> we'll have a great time with that but this is the reason why investment grade credit has been in the sweet spot as phil camparelli of yes. jp morgan was talking about because they're not optimistic enough to go into u.s uh, equities but they do want to get that income and matt brill has suddenly found himself from the pariah to the golden child overnight <clears throat> matt brill head of u.s investment grade for north america and senior portfolio manager at invesco has a gone too far. Hey, good morning. Last year was just really, really tough. And we were far from the golden child last year. And it was a challenge. But then it got to the fourth quarter and things started to look extremely attractive. You got to about 6% yield on investment grade credit. Nobody really wanted to buy it then, though. They were still very nervous. They said, we'll wait till the we'll, we'll, we'll enter when the Fed stops hiking. And all of a sudden, we've ripped about 100 basis points. Returns are up about 10% since the end of October. Um, so it's come a long way, but we do look at things now. We still say there's still around 5% for IG credit, which looks attractive to us over the long term. And we think their yields are going to still go lower over the year, and you're going to get that carry. Over the long term? Is over the long term the, the past 10 years, or is over the long term the past 50 years? Yeah, so definitely over the last 10 years. But then we look back in the, kind of the 2006 range, 2005 range, and pre-distortion pre by the Fed. And pre-distortion by the Fed, you did not tend to get yields much higher than 5%. So we think that that's normal, um, attractive over the long run. And over the near term, looks very attractive, though. Microsoft, 4.3% in debt. Are you going to see the mother of all issuance here? Every CFO is going, I missed the bottom. Do they like lemmings off a cliff, <laughs> dive in now? So it's interesting. We're actually seeing the opposite is that a lot of companies are saying, it's expensive to borrow right now. And what we're finding is that most companies are actually finding that if they want to borrow for three or five years, it costs them 5%. If they want to borrow for 30 years, it's also still around 5%. And to them, they think 30 years at 5% is, is expensive. So we're seeing companies only issue three and five-year bonds, maybe a little bit of 10-year bonds. Um, the issuance of 20 years or longer is only about 5% year to date. So companies actually are still finding this expensive. I do think um, with the, the tech companies where they've had some troubles, um, they've been laying off uh, workers, they might want to borrow, but they don't want to borrow at these levels. They actually still find them pretty, pretty punitive um, 
versus yeah, but, where they're borrowing just a few years ago. I mean, the reality here, folks, is they dial one eight hundred Matt Bro. I mean, that's <laughs> the truth. That's a story. They call you know your good competitors and, and all that. Is your phone ringing off the hook? I mean, are people trying to sell you you know medium duration stuff? So they're they're trying. It's 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 really fascinating. Is that they're they're not issuing a lot of paper right now. The banks are not issuing almost. Any, banks have really only Morgan Stanley has issued really any significant amount of debt this year. The other banks haven't issued at all. I think Bank of America made it a three year. Um, typical corporations on the industrial side of things are borrowing, but at a much lesser amount. So it's it's very different than than 2020, where everybody was borrowing because they were borrowing for one two percent for 30 40 years. Well, but this is the reason why you saw this migration within the index <clears throat> to a lower quality to a more leverage kind of company. Are we going to see the reverse of that as companies do see rates as punitive, as a lot of companies look to pay down what they have rather than borrow more? Yes. And that's great for us versus we, we hate when companies go borrow to buy back stock. We hate when companies lever up their balance sheet to go buy competitors. Right now, they're saying it doesn't make a lot of sense to go borrow at four, four and a half, five percent to, to buy back our stock, even <clears throat> as much as their stocks are right. down. Um, so for the most part, people are paying down debt and uh, companies' balance sheets are getting better, which we need because the economy is going to start to slow. And if it's if they're not out in, in front of that, um, they're going to have some problems. Can I just say, folks, that what you're hearing here with a grizzled pro is what we call real bond talk. Real bond. It's not like, what's the Fed going to do? What's inflation going to do? It's not economics. It's like real bond talk right now. When do we get back to a confidence in longer duration paper that we can own it? I mean, I'll go seven years, forget about <laughs> 20, but when do we get back to Boise Cascade putting out a nine-year piece or a, a 10-year piece? So the confidence, unfortunately, comes back when the returns are already there. Um, that's what we tend to find. Top so, of the market's what we call that. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, we, we've started to see flows pick up, but people yeah. are still just barely dip, dipping their toes into the water. Um, I'm a little nervous that rates could run too much before people get involved. I, I think there's a lot of investors that are in T-bills that's just been sitting there and rolling T-bills. Yeah, the cash charts are stunning. Yeah, it, I, mean, it, I mean, we're I'm making saying, jokes about yeah, exactly. it, but it's stunning. Am I right? Yeah. And, and we're begging them. Know. You know, we, there, we think refinance risk is a real, or, excuse me, uh, uh, and reinvestment risk is a real thing for, for investors this year. Re reinvestment risk, meaning what does that mean? It Translate means that, that if you borrow for six months, that's great. But what do you do when six months when that bond matures? Does that mean that you think the Fed's going to be cutting rates by the end of this year to not real bond talk? We don't think they're going to cut by the end of this year. We do think early 2024 it, it, it's on. And that's when you could see 100 basis points in the first quarter of 2024. His entourage, I mean, do you see the entourage Matt Bro brings with him? It's they're they're like, like a... taping it. They're in code. They're sending smoke signals back to Atlanta right now. What he's you're saying or that is it's fun, though, right? I mean, yeah. after the carnage. Yeah. I mean, seriously, last year was worse since 1788 or whatever. Are you having fun this year, finally? We're having fun. We've got a very cool crew with sunglasses on. They're all walking around, you know, feel, feeling the love this year. Oh, but last year was so work from home. <laughs> last work year, from home last is what year we was call very, that. very tough. I want to I, I yeah. be honest. You know, we have not made up any nearly even a third of the gains that that were. When a third do of you the make up the carnage year. of last year? Keep so three I, I do years, think five years. I think it's a it's a two year time frame. Um, I think this year you could still see double digit returns. We're up four already. I think you could get carry and a little bit of tightening gets you ten percent. That's that's a pretty good year. Tweaking, it's the way to go, I guess. That's for us. It's what grade. it is. That's I, the happiest double. I've ever seen. You <laughs> know. That's a great uh, <laughs> bond portfolio manager. Well, I mean, this is sort of the the sweet spot for them. If you've got slowing growth, companies deleveraging, and uh, rates potentially plateauing or coming down. That's the happiest I've seen Matt Brill in <laughs> two and a half years. I mean, it's it's good. I mean, this is the change. The changes, folks. We're trying to give you these seismic changes here. And in the yield market, to me, there's never a discussion about the issuance flows, which you know that's what you. You did. I mean, well, yeah, issuance, issuance has been down. All of the technicals supporting some of the rally as yeah. well if companies aren't selling debt, aren't really yeah. increasing their leverage. Matt Brill moving the equity markets higher. <laughs> Futures up 17. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg Surveillance from New York. Jonathan Farrow at 9 o'clock. Look for that in London as well. Lisa Bramlett and Tom Keene. We're getting ready for economic data. I thought it was yesterday. Lisa corrected me, as she does. Thursday with claims. 
but with a lot of other data. And there's no one better to lead our coverage of this than Michael McKee. And part of that, not just Thursday in claims, but Thursday in a look back to the 90 days, the Q4 of 2022. Michael McKee, we don't see GDP yet, do we? We don't see GDP yet, but we are looking for it uh, very shortly here. It should come out at any time. There we go. Better than expected, 2.9%. That's down from 3.2% in the third quarter, but that is still a, a very good number. So we're not going to complain about that at all. I'm calling up the current release. I'll get you the uh, breakdown sure. on that in just a second. But let's go through all of the other numbers we have to do, which is a lot. Uh, the trade deficit actually widens in uh, the month of December, 90.3% billion from 82.9 billion that's a bit of a surprise and i'm sure it will have some uh effect on the overall GDP numbers. Speaking of uh, GDP, the uh, the price index, the PCE index on a quarterly basis drops to 3.5% from 4.4%. The core 39 from 47 Those are uh, be better than the prior quarter, but not as good as uh, was forecast. So um, make that of that what you will. We get the rest of the GDP, uh, the, the December numbers, which will really matter to the Fed tomorrow. Uh, wholesale inventory Inventories rise a tenth of a percent. Retail inventories a uh, half a percent. Those will feed into those GDP numbers. Jobless claims. Hold on to your hat, Tom. I'm holding. And you have a good-looking hat. 186,000 last week. This is not the droids we're looking for. Well, uh, that's down from a revised 192. Um, uh, you look at the numbers for two seconds, folks. I'm going to sell this to you. We've got a very busy half hour. We're coming to you across all of radio and television without commercial interruption. This 30 minutes or so important. Shanali Bassick will be with Jonathan uh, Gray. But far more after that, McKee and I will grill on the stunning jobless claims numbers. And, and Michael, it goes back to four-week moving average. And that dovetail claims right now into a 2.9% GDP statistic. Well, I'm you, worried. You, well, it's terrible. It's a terrible thing. Uh, I need economy. to get to the breakdown of GDP, but I think at this point it just tells you that uh, the economy in the fourth quarter and it was uh, reasonably strong, and the economy, uh, the labor market economy, <clears throat> is still strong right now. But there are reasons for that. Stay tuned, as Tom says. A couple more numbers here that we got to get to. 5.6% is the durable goods orders increase in the month of December. That's uh, up from a negative 1.7, so that's really good. But X Transportation down 01. Now, we know Boeing had a uh, poor yeah. quarter, so uh, that probably has the, uh, the major impact. Capital goods orders, non defects, X Air. This is what goes into GDP directly, down two tenths right. after a one tenth gain the month before. Uh, Shipments yeah. were down four tenths, so that's going to have an impact right. on GDP as well. Lisa, with the markets here, yields are higher. We're going to go into the futures up 13. Lisa, to me, I mean, is tuition a capital goods? <laughs> well, it's perhaps a service. I don't know. Okay. Uh, but don't I'm know. looking right now at that two-year yield. I really want to hone in on that because it's 4.18% and climbing higher uh, from earlier, 4.12%. Uh, and honestly, Mike, when you take a look at this data, do you buy the story that people say this is backward-looking and that, that what we've gotten in terms of leading economic indicators shows a much more rapid shift that supports the soft landing that people talk about now? Well, some of the data seem to be pointing in that direction. A lot of people are uh, ragging on the uh, index of leading indicators. But uh, some of the numbers that we're getting are better than expected. And so uh, there's a feeling that maybe things aren't as bad. Certainly GDP is a backward-looking number, but it does give us some idea of where uh, we are well. and where we are going. Taking a look at uh, some of the GDP numbers here, we can say the GDP for the year of 2022 grew 2.1%. Uh, forecasts are we're going to have a bad year this year, but 2.1% uh, certainly better than people thought. Personal consumption was up 2.1% in the fourth quarter, and uh, that compares with an anticipated 2.9%. So that comes in a light, little lighter, down from 2.3%. Good spending was up 1.1% after declining four-tenths in the third quarter, whereas services were up by uh, 2 percent That's down from 3.7%. So the mix a little different than maybe people anticipated. Yeah. Investment by businesses, business spending, non-residential fixed investment up seven-tenths. Residential investment. Uh, this Please. is where the Fed has had a, a, an effect. Anybody want to guess?
yes. Negative 26.1% after a negative 27.1%. Oh, all of that, percent. Um, um, it, all of that it, was in six blocks of Lisa's house. <laughs> <laughs> Things are going down. Have you down. ever seen that number? <laughs> have you ever seen a number that uh, We saw it in the, in the 2000, you know, the, the wake of the great financial okay. crisis in 2008. Well, uh, let me just uh, check. One more number. Yeah, uh, <laughs> give you one more number. And this is one that people uh, really want to pay attention to because it kind of strips out the effect of yep. inventories and trade. It, it, final demand for domestic product up 1.4%. It was 4.5% in the third quarter, but 1.3% in That's the second. That's the key so number. In general, yeah. uh, it's held up, but it's not extraordinarily right. strong. This is a big number in the Q4 adjusted by things away from domestic final sales. Michael McKee will have an important comment for us here in about 15 uh, minutes. We're going to continue now. And on this American economy, Lindsay Piegs joins us, chief economist at Stiefel. Lindsay, are we near recession? I, I think we are teetering towards a recession. Now, of course, the fourth quarter number does look pretty good, particularly against the backdrop of an even stronger rise in the third quarter. But when we look at what's happening with the consumer, which is the backbone of the U.S. economy, we are seeing a clear loss of momentum. And without the consumer happy and healthy out in the marketplace, we simply cannot expect to maintain positive growth, let alone more robust growth, similar to what we saw this morning. So I do think that as the yeah. Fed continues to raise rates, savings are depleted, real income remains negative fiscal support fades, there is going to be an additional burden on the consumer that leads us into or uh, near negative right. growth. Lindsay, long ago and far away, under the religion of the Kool-Aid of Peter Lynch of Fidelity, domestic final sales reign supreme. Michael McKee just mentioned that that trend, that tendency there, away from the back and forth of imports, exports, and the rest, is a pretty moldy number. Do you have a belief here that a slowdown in domestic final sales brings on the reality of recession? It certainly does, because just like when we look at inflation, we strip out the more volatile components of food and energy. That's what we're doing when we look at that real final sales number to uh, domestic pur uh, purchasers. We're stripping out the volatility of inventory. We're stripping out the volatility of trade. And what we see is a more clear, defined downward trajectory of growth, slowing from up near 4 percent to down near 1 percent at the end of the year. Again, still, there was enough resilience in the U.S. economy to maintain positive positive momentum in Q4. But the bigger question is, are we able to maintain that momentum as we turn the calendar page? And most of the data suggests that we do not. Lindsay, do you think that the market is wrong because we are seeing consumer stocks do really well as they look forward? I think the market is severely underappreciating the amount of tightening that the Fed is going to have to embark on in order to reinstate price stability and thus underappreciating the amount of pressure that is going to be put on consumers and businesses and the overall economy. When do you start to see the data to actually prove that before thinking, well, maybe the Fed is going to be on the side. You do see inflation coming down and we're going to get that soft landing that everybody's talking about. I think we're already seeing it in the data. When we look at retail sales, negative in November, negative in December, consumer spending still positive. But when we look at overall goods and services, that too is trending down. Production now in, uh, in contractionary territory, housing taking a sizable hit. There are multiple, right. multiple data points that are suggesting the U.S. economy is not going to be able to maintain this momentum in the new year. And Lindsay, thank you so much. Lindsay Piegs, it was stiff, stiefel, great that she's with us today. And Michael McKee mentioning that housing hit, which is a negative 25-ish percent uh, statistic, something that shows a unique concern. Liz Ann Saunders mentioning housing is critical to her uh, in the previous hours. Uh, you know, that's it, it's 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 original right now is how I would put it. And the view ahead is what we've been trying to glean from all of the earnings, both from uh, the on-the-ground companies, the manufacturers, as well as some of the asset managers. And Chanelli Bosick has been covering all of it for us here. And I'm curious, especially with Blackstone and their reported earnings, uh, what we're going to hear from John Gray, the chief operating officer, as he joins us now. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we are going to hear from John Gray just shortly here. We're going to be joined by President and CEO of Blackstone, just shy of a trillion dollars in assets under management. John, thank you so much for joining us this morning. When you take a look at your results, as you've reported them for the year, you had a tougher quarter than you've had in a while. A lot of that underperformance was in real estate. So my question to you is, when does the pain end? 
Well, Shanali, it's great to be here. Uh, the fourth quarter was a tough backdrop in markets. We also had some timing issues that make comparisons hard. But when you look for the year, we really delivered um, for our shareholders. We had earnings growth, distributable earnings growth of 8%. We grew our AUM 11%. And most importantly, although in the fourth quarter we had some modest declines, we delivered in terms of performance. Uh, we protected uh, the capital of our limited partners, generated positive performance in real estate in particular, and that was a reflection of where we deployed capital. And so I think when you allocate capital to the right places, you can overcome a challenging environment. If you focus on travel and travel-related assets, energy, floating rate credit, logistics and rental housing and real estate, quant and macro and hedge funds, that really made a difference. But I think in terms of your question on when we get these headwinds behind us, I think the good news is the inflation pressures seem to be abating and the 10-year Treasury moving down. And the biggest headwind has been on multiples. The good sectors we're in have performed well. The pressure's been on multiples. Some of that pressure seems to be going away now. So we're well over last year. We're well into this year. So how are you positioning Blackstone to capitalize of the market of today? Well, the great thing about our business is because investors have so much confidence in us. They've allocated $226 billion to us last year. You mentioned nearly a trillion dollars of assets. We have $187 billion of dry powder. And so what we're looking for now are the most compelling opportunities. I would say private credit, very interesting. Base rates are up, spreads are wider. You get paid equity-like returns for being a lender and corporate credit and real estate credit. I think there are also some companies out there that may not be uh, defaulting, and default rates remain very low, but may need some capital. So our tactical opportunities business can help them with some structured preferred equity to help them get through maybe a tough patch. And then I think the public markets and some of the sectors where there have been big trade-offs uh, in technology, in real estate, there'll be opportunities to buy some good businesses well, that are trading at what we think of as attractive prices. John, let's talk about the opportunity of the past and whether it continues to be going forward. I know that, for example, single-family homes was a big point of play for Blackstone. Is it still? You know, I think the single-family space was very favorable coming out of the financial crisis because new construction fell, home prices were at big discounts. Um, we continue to like housing generally because there's a shortage. We've been underbuilding housing about half below what we need relative to sort of obsolescence and population growth really since the financial crisis. Now, I think you have to draw a distinction between for sale housing driven by mortgage rates and homes that are rented out where there is still upward pressure on rental rates, albeit slower than last year. So I think it's still a good long-term area. Obviously, the housing market faces some challenges, but rental housing is much, much stronger than for sale housing. Perhaps for a hold situation, but I am wondering, especially given the auctions that people talked about that used to be just bought up by institutional investors without it really even getting an open house, are those days over? Well, the market is definitely cooler. Cost of financing has gone up, um, and, and that has resulted in, you know, uh, an adjustment happening with prices. That's happening across private markets. And so I do think it will not be as heated as you described going forward. But as an asset class, I think selectively single family for rent is interesting, but it's worth noting it's a tiny piece of the overall U.S. housing stock. I think it represents less than 1 percent. It's not really a key driver, but some of these large companies I think can operate and deliver customers uh, an opportunity to live in a community at a reasonable cost, and I think that's a win-win. You know, I want to kind of jump to the whale in the room here. That's BREIT. And this is this interval fund that you have tied to the real estate sector that has certain pressures in it, whether it's on the investor side or whether it's the broader market. And I'm wondering, you know, you have this extra $500 million that University of California had just given you. How much of this is to meet new redemption requests? And when do the redemptions stop? 
So BREIT is a vehicle that we're incredibly proud of. We started it six years ago to give individual investors access to private real estate. It's delivered 12.5% annual returns over that period, more than three times the public REIT market. It's happened because we focused in the right sectors, in rental housing, in logistics, huge concentration in the Sun Belt, places like Texas and Florida, and we've delivered for customers. As you pointed out, there have been some elevated redemptions. It happened over the summer. And then there's been what I'd describe as uh, a challenging uh, media cycle, sort of relentlessly negative news, focused on redemptions. And we got this large investment, now $4.5 billion from Cal Regions, that really affirms the quality of the portfolio and its outlook. And they have a structure with us that gives them some protection on the downside, but they made this investment because they believe in BREIT, they believe in the quality of the properties. And I would say one other thing, Shanali, what we found fascinating is that the focus is all about flows. It reminds me a little bit of a sporting event uh, where people are focused on uh, how many fans are in the stands. They're not looking at what's happening on the playing field. Yesterday, we announced that mm -hmm. estimated same-store cash flow growth was 13 percent in BREIT. That's really powerful. You know, the press isn't focused on that. That's what we're focused on, because if we deliver for the underlying customers, the flows will take care of themselves over time. You know, I want to kind of put Blackstone in context here in the broader financial industry, because there's been this huge move to private markets. But private markets, your stock took a nearly 43 percent hit last year. It's back up this year. But how do you play against your peers here when you look at the investments you're going to make this year? Are you slowing hiring? Do you have to pull back in a meaningful way, given the choppiness of what the environment looks like? Well, the underlying trends in our business remain incredibly strong. I mean, the fact that we grew AUM 11 percent in this difficult environment, we're seeing growth with our drawdown funds. We have a $150 billion target. We're going to say on our earnings call today that we've raised $100 billion of that for our drawdown mm -hmm. funds and still reaffirm that target. We've got very fast growth in our insurance segment. Our institutional perpetual vehicles like infrastructure continue to grow. And in the individual investor area, private wealth, which you focused a lot on, we were up significantly. We were up 25 percent in assets for the year. But and so as a result of that, to your question, we, we will hire more people, but at a much slower rate than we did in the in 2022. Is this really the beginning of the end of the peak, this sort of heyday of private equity of delivering 15 percent returns? Are we entering a new slower grind that is perhaps a little bit more back to reality? You know, we've been hearing this now for nearly 40 years since we started investing in private markets. And every time there's a downturn, there's a sense that, you know, the era is over, that private markets can't deliver. And yet we've had a durable premium across the board in our funds. And that's the reason why we've continued to grow. And we feel like in downturns, that tends to expand. So our confidence in our ability to deploy capital, also add value to the assets with our teams, is as high as ever. Obviously, if the market's tougher, that makes it harder. But I think the premium return we can deliver to customers, that continues to exist. That's really the fundamental value proposition for us. You know, John, on one hand, I know you have to prepare for all scenarios here. But if you have to kind of calculate your worst case scenario, what are you really preparing for as far as how bad things could get this year? Well, I think the good news is the, the really bad um, and, and big challenging risk was a wage price spiral in inflation. And it appears based on what market data is saying and what we're seeing in our portfolio companies, that's not happening. Commodity costs, shipping costs, they're coming down. The labor market we're seeing in our portfolio is starting to cool. We actually have a third more, a third less job vacancies at our company. Wages, which had been running at 7 percent in North America last year, are now down at up 5.8. So inflation coming down takes off the biggest risk. I think the main risk that exists is the economy decelerating as a result of, of this Fed policy. I think they're going to take rates up into the low fives. 
hold it there for a while. And that medicine takes time to work through the system. And so I think a sort of cumulative deceleration is probably the biggest risk. But I would say when I compare this to 08, 09, when we had excess in housing, excess in commercial real estate, excess in the financial industry, we just don't have that. So our, our estimation is things are definitely going to slow, but I don't think it's going to be one of those worst-case scenarios. John Gray of Blackstone, thank you. Shanelli Basik, always wonderful. Thank you so much uh, for being with us. And we heard it right there. I mean, honestly, this is really the question. Does the Fed get to the low fives in terms of a terminal Fed funds yeah. rate like John Gray is talking about, given the data that shows resilience, not this tapering off that a lot of people are talking you know, about? Mr. Gray talked in his book there, but I would point out there's a lot of other people not in financial institutions instruments uh, feeling the same way I and mean, it's really picked up and that's the reason why at yeah. what point does the reality kind of push back against that futures bit? up 22 they advanced Dow futures up smartly nasdaq really on a roll let me give it pharaoh would say I, john's in my ear i can hear him here in london he's saying give the percentage move up a stick on the nasdaq uh, right now with yield set higher we're going to pause this is a real luxury with six and a half minutes here to talk to Michael McKee about all the work he does, the papers he piles through, the detail he does that I don't, about a fully employed America. He and I know, if you look at the claim statistics, McKee 101 is, it's a fully employed America, but it's not, is it? Well, it's kind of weird because all we've had lately are all these announcements, <clears throat> particularly from tech companies and financials, that they're cutting jobs, thousands and thousands of jobs, and yet jobless claims are only at, as we saw today, 186,000. Uh, how can that be? Well, there are a couple reasons, and this time I'm not even going to cite uh, seasonal adjustment problems. The, the first and biggest reason is they may not have taken place already. Companies are required to give employees 60 days warning with what's called a warn notice of impending mass layoffs. Now, uh, Google, for example, announced 12,000 layoffs this month, but its warn notice to those in New York said the layoffs would not begin until April. It's called a warn notice. So it's called a is warn notice. Is that the envelope I've got home in the kitchen? Yes, but the good news is Chipotle is hiring. So oh, good. I feel better You're already. safe. Uh, but uh, we're not going to see a rise in jobless claims if people aren't getting laid off yet. That could come later in the year, and that could push unemployment up later in the year. Now, not every cut means that people are losing a job because companies may not fill currently open jobs or those of employees who've already made plans to leave. Not all the job cuts are in the United States. 3M this week, 2,500 job cuts, but they said that was globally. And with labor markets tight, of course, some laid off workers may find new jobs quickly, and they're not even getting the jobless claims because they've got some severance that they're going to live on in between. Now, no question, with interest rates rising, as John Gray was talking about, we should see more people lose their jobs. We should. Economists surveyed by uh, Bloomberg forecast that if unemployment will rise to 4.8 percent by the end of the year. That would be, guys, more than 1.8 million jobs. I'm going to ask kind of a sacrilegious question. Is this data reliable? Is this data perhaps a bit distorted from some of the leading indicators that we're getting? Well, you could uh, use that as a, a, one, a, a fifth reason. Uh, there are some concerns about the way states are processing claims. They got overwhelmed during the uh, pandemic, and some of their systems are really old and antiquated. We saw a lot of fraud before uh, <clears throat> that pushed up claims numbers. So it's hard to say this is totally accurate, but it's the best we've got at this point. And even if if you're just looking at the trend, the trend right. is rather amazing. I just looked at one of John Gray's apartments. I'm some thinking of sliding into 2,500 square feet, three bedrooms, three baths, three, 2,300 a month, 3,200 a month. It's something completely outside the frame of reference of anybody sitting at this table. The unemployment rate in Kansas, area code 666219, is 2.2%. Are we fully employed? Uh, at this point, we appear to be pretty much fully employed. Actually, by the Fed's definition, which is somewhere around 4% or a little above, uh, we're more than fully employed. So, uh, I mean, we are below the, the Nehru number, as they like. So uh, at this point, um, the Fed is looking at 
the fact that we are fully employed, <clears throat> that all these people have jobs and they're looking yeah. at the spending possibilities, which we saw in GDP, and saying maybe we still got to do more. Can I suggest that the last time the Nehru number had validity, I was wearing a Nehru suit? Is that like close? <laughs> are we close there? Uh, the problem with Nehru, which is the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment, is what level of unemployment yeah. makes inflation go up. The problem with that is it's a number you can't observe in real time. You can only sort of look at it. Like by checking it Looking account. backwards. Lisa, to save me here. Yeah. Well, I was He's just on give fire. You <laughs> McKee's on fire. The rent report. Because we were talking about rents and this component of the inflation. And U.S. apartments rents rose 4.7% in December, which is the slowest pace going back to July 2021. It's a huge deal. And this is a huge deal. Rent.com, this, this deal. research provider, expects that rents I, may be declining on a year-over-year -year <clears throat> basis by the summer. Bring up this banner here. I think this is so, so important. On radio, three bedrooms, three baths, $3,220 a month for a house. Kansas 66219. Where we pay? live, Lisa, <laughs> is completely artificial. Well, but it's catching up, and that's the interesting thing. If you look at the price increases, they've happened much faster in the Kansases of the world than they have the New York Cities <clears> of the world. So at what point do you start to see the real softening there at a disproportionate pace? Yeah. I mean, it's really been a, a motley picture. Well, a question for Jay Powell at his news conference is going to be, are you seriously looking through the rental numbers? Because it takes a long time to get into the price indexes. You look at core uh, PCE for oh. the quarter, 3.9%. That should be a reason to celebrate. It should be lower if you're looking through it and well, look at the numbers least of The market celebrates. We go to John Farrell in London on television when the future is up 24. Please stay with us. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Good morning.